It is now 10.30 a.m. as we do all meetings. We will start with a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. flag and the Texas flag. I'd like to ask Mr. David Alex to lead us in the pledges to, the both, to both flags at the appropriate time. Please rise. Thank you. David? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one indivisible. Thank you. Public comments. We have um, one. Vic. Is that Sprechter? Cool. Thanks. Welcome. Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity to address. Uh, I'm Vic Sprecher from South Padre Island, Texas, and I have been involved with uh, the Ocean City, Maryland Beach Patrol for years and moved to South Padre Island in 2006 and discovered an unusual amount of drownings that were occurring on our beach uh, where we made a plea to our then aldermen um, as we found that in 2002 to 2007 we had 27 drownings on our beaches. <clears throat> we initiated a, uh, a beach patrol in 2008 and from 2008 until 2011 we have had no drownings in South Padre Island on any of the city beaches. I have been working with uh, both Chief <coughs> Basket, who is uh, now in charge of our beach patrol, <coughs> as well as the Coast Guard, and we have uh, found that we have 22 drownings, specifically in our county, on our county beaches that include um, Isla Blanca Park, Andy Bowie Park, Beach Access 5, and very limited area in 2006. Our investment from reducing the deaths in South Padre Island has been $100,000 annually, um, and it continues from 2008 until 2011. We believe that if you considered uh, such a program that would protect our beaches during the summertime from a nine o'clock in the morning until uh, six o'clock in the evening, it would require an investment of approximately fifty to seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. In working with Chief Basket, although I'm not representing our South Padre Island Beach Patrol, <clears throat> we would be uh, they would be happy to work with you in providing the manpower for the investment of the fifty to seventy-five thousand, and we believe that we could. Uh, eliminate any drownings from our beaches, uh, specifically in the county. Um, and I ask for consideration uh, and would do whatever I could as a recently retired uh, person from the business community. So I thank you for your consideration. Uh, I can be reached uh, however you'd like to get in touch with me, and, uh, and hopefully we can eliminate these, uh, these drownings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. I would recommend that you get with Javier Mendez, our parks director, uh, and visit with him a little bit more. This topic has come up before, and we've discussed it, so uh, go ahead and visit with him when you get a chance. He's in the back, all right? Thank you. Presentation. Presentation by uh, JM regarding One Piece GPS offender tracking system. Are they here? There's 3M. 3M? 3M, what did I say? G GPS by 3M regarding one piece GPS offender tracking. You've got about uh, five minutes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is David Tellerico and I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. 
regarding our One Piece GPS bracelet. Um, my, uh, you know, I, I represent 3M, and as uh, I, I've got a, got a bag of products here at 3M uh, that everybody's familiar with, uh, scotch tape and, and post-it notes and everything else, and everybody in this room uses 3M products in their, in their homes every day. Um, we have a division within 3M that does electronic monitoring. Uh, it's under our track and trace division, and um, we offer uh, a multitude of different electronic monitoring bracelets, GPS, house arrest, uh, alcohol monitoring uh, uh, units, and similar type products. And the whole idea is that we want to be able to offer communities like Cameron County the opportunity to, to benefit from our research and development and, and our technology to help reduce costs to, to taxpayers. Um, I wanted to just talk briefly about 3M and, and our, uh, our, our presence in Texas. Uh, we have over 1,700 employees in Texas right now, and uh, our payroll was, over this past year, was over $170 million in Texas, and we paid state and local taxes of over $11 million. Um, with that being said, uh, I wanted to talk about a reseller that we have locally, and uh, the Recovery Healthcare, and, and they're behind me here. And uh, Recovery Healthcare is, is our prime reseller in Texas. And uh, we monitor close to 3,000 offenders in Texas alone on, on this one piece GPS bracelet that you have in front of you. And uh, in addition, uh, Recovery Healthcare monitors over 2,000 offenders either through the GPS bracelet or, or some other technologies. Um, they are what we consider experts in the field. Uh, they have a local office here in, in Edinburgh and, uh, and people on the ground. Um, I'm going to talk about the. Thank you, David. I'm Larry Vanderwood. I'm CEO of Recovery Healthcare. I'll just be brief. Uh, we have over 100 employees in the state of Texas. We monitor uh, offenders. We have 2,100 folks that we monitor on 24-7. We're in over 100 counties in the state of Texas. Uh, we do anywhere from uh, jail depopulation to probation. We have contracts with probation, sheriffs, county jails, counties. Uh, we offer several types where we uh, we offer an offender funded. Our, most of our business is offender funded, and what's good about that, it doesn't cost the county a dime. We do all the uh, collection and all the monitoring for you. Uh, we also have several programs where the county pays, or we'll have a hybrid where we'll break it up to where whoever, if the offenders can afford it, uh, they can pay for it. Uh, if they are indigent, then you can pay for it. We can have an indigent status and an indigent fund for you. So uh, it's whatever you folks desire. Uh, we have four folks here that we employ, uh, boots on the ground here, and we can install bracelets at any time. Questions? I know that's brief. This is Mr. Longoria. He's our local representative. Basically, we, we're here. We're here every day. And uh, if it'll help your uh, problem with jail overcrowding, tremendous. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Could you cover the cost issue? For if we, if we uh, say our sheriff's department installs the bracelets versus the uh, third party? Absolutely. We can do, um, you know, we have a direct contract with the TDCJ. Uh -huh. and, uh, and if that's the route you, you choose, that's a contract vehicle that you can go to. Uh, the cost would be in the range of uh, five to six dollars a day, depending on what your, you know, what your, um, uh, want, what type of equipment you wanted. However, there's additional cost to the, to the department that actually has to hire the employees to do the installations, the removals, and then that's going to be a county pay. So you're looking at, uh, it could be, um, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars to to monitor offenders. I do have a graph here that just indicates that, um, you know, I, I read an article regarding the, the the cost of inmates going out of county. And um, you know it, it's roughly a couple million dollars a year annually if, if you're sending offenders out of county because you don't have space in this jail um, to keep those. I, I estimated that it was seventy-five dollars a day that it would cost. I don't know exactly what the cost is. It would, it would come out to about eighty-eight different offenders that are being sent uh, out of county. Um, to put those eighty-eight offenders on an uh, on an offender pay program would cost nothing to the to Camera County. If Camera County wanted to do the installations removals, retrievals, and all those things, then you're looking at about $500,000. But it, it varies with uh, 
it, it varies with the type of technology that you want to use. And we would be responsible for the equipment at that, in that particular scenario, right? Absolutely. The other scenario where you um, have the third party vendor, what is the cost per day of the equipment to the county if it goes that way or to the offender? Uh, on the offender uh, uh, agency pay with us, it's $5.50 well, a day. Well, let me, but before we go in, into the into the, those specifics, we have sure. a, another presentation. Right. And, and if, if we decide or if the court decides to, um, to RFP or RFQ out this process, you may not want to be giving out your, your, your prize at this, but just, just for your protection, OK? Sure. Sure. So you may want to just hold off on that and maybe visit with the commissioner uh, outside of this setting if he wants to know specifics, but just in fairness to you and then the other group that's going to be coming in after you. I appreciate that, okay. but I would also like to mention that we do have contract vehicles that, like the TDCJ, that doesn't require an RFP or an RFQ, and it also, with, with a, uh, they currently have a memor memorandum of understanding with the probation department here in Cameron County that's already active, and, and we're just looking to expand that and okay. be able to. Judge, the, the reason I asked that is because I already know the answer. Well, I wanted don't. to make sure all of y'all knew the answer, but that's fine. Yeah, and it would have been fine, but when we have maybe a potential, an, another service provider that may, you know, just want to, just to protect yourselves from Let that. the bidding wars begin. Right? <laughs> I like it. All right. Any well, other? thank you very Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Do I hear a motion to acknowledge that presentation? So moved. By Commissioner Second. Hernandez, second by Commissioner Benavides. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, Adam carries. Thank you. Item B, presentation by GEO Care, Inc. regarding GPS offender tracking system. Good morning, Judge Keskos, uh, members of the commission. Uh, my name is David Scharf. I am the business development director for GEO Care's uh, community-based services. And what we're here to talk to you this morning a little bit about is a comprehensive criminal justice solution uh, to your jail, jail overcrowding issues. Uh, we talked to the sheriff uh, last week about this initiative and wanted to share it with you. What we're proposing for Cameron County is a community-based day reporting, community-based center uh, that would be co-located on the grounds of a facility that we do have an operation in Cameron County. We have a federal BOP contract halfway house uh, already. Uh, we're proposing to site uh, a day reporting center in, in close proximity to that location. The premise behind what we offer is based on evidence-based practices. That is what works in corrections. What we propose to you is to alleviate your jail overcrowding issue immediately by offering the judiciary some options, some sentencing options to place folks in the center. And second, and as important, is the reduction of recidivism that comes along with the programming that we offer. Evidence-based programming um, that we've implemented in, in all the things that we do has had, a, has had a tremendous impact on reducing recidivism rates in all the facilities that we've run. What happens in general is that an offender is placed under our supervision. They're subjected to a validated risk needs assessment that allows us to identify what we call criminogenic factors. And those are the risk and needs factors um, that may have caused criminal behavior. And they can be as subtle as lack of education, uh, underemployment, et cetera, all the way through uh, to substance abuse issues, mental health issues, uh, and, and employment placement and retention. The key portion of what we do is cognitive behavior therapy, that is cr changing criminal thinking. A large portion of our program is based on what we call moral recognition therapy or cognitive behavior therapy. That's the crux of what we do. The research has told us that that piece has the most impact on reducing criminal behavior. So what we're proposing to you is a center. Uh, we're, we're, again, co-located uh, near the facility we have in Cameron County that would be staffed by locals um, who are case managers who will, who will take offenders in conjunction with uh, probation or whomever the sentencing uh, authority may be and move them through that program, about a 180-day program, with the ultimate goal of, again, alleviating a jail of a crowding issue and, most importantly, to the community, reducing crime. We look at this as a, cr a smart on crime prevention initiative, not so much of a community supervision initiative. But this will help you reduce your crime rate in this county. We've proven to reduce recidivism up to 60% in many of the jurisdictions that we serve. As well, um, BI, our subsidiary company, also has many of the technologies that you heard about this morning from our colleagues at, at 3M. Uh, we were the inventors of radio frequency tracking, house arrest detention programs. We also have GPS devices. 
We have uh, transdermal alcohol devices that we use in-house that belong to us. So what we have to offer, again, is a very much a comprehensive crime reduction, recidivism reduction, jail overcrowding relief, release and relief initiative uh, that will help you in the short term and in the long term. Questions? Any, any questions? Basically, guess, go ahead. I'm sorry. I guess the question I would have is that while we are the ones that have to uh, come up with the money to pay for all our jail overcrowding outside our county, uh, to house them out there, it's important to us that the judiciary, the judges, uh, buy into the program. I know you have a lot of offenders that are nonviolent, they're in jail because they can't afford to pay child support. So by having them in jail, it does no good. What kind of incentive programs do you have for that? Uh, a variety, Commissioner. What's, what's interesting about the program that we have is it's able to be morphed into a number of criminal justice populations, pretrial, uh, uh, civil non-contempt, child support, probation violation, parole violators, potential probation violators. The program has proven effective in all of those factors um, to, to, uh, to, to relieve that jail overcrowding issue. And again, and most importantly, reduce that high recidivism rate. Nationwide, two-thirds of all inmates are back in prison within three years. That hasn't changed for many, many years. As a criminal justice community, I believe we have an obligation to address the factors that have caused that high recidivism rate amongst offenders. And the same is true on a local basis in jail. I'm a 25-year retired uh, uh, criminal justice practitioner from South Florida. Um, I've seen this, this recidivism over and over again in the jails and in the state. The programs that we are, that we are recommending to you this morning, um, in my opinion, have had some of the greatest effects on reducing crimes in communities by addressing those criminogenic needs and risks that are associated with criminal, be criminal behavior. What we have found that criminal thinking, while it can be changed, <coughs> is usually not considered by, by, by the offender population. It's consequential thinking. What if I do this? What if I do that? That's not happening mostly with younger folks in our community. So this, this MRT, this more recognition therapy, cognitive behavior that's applied to every person who's in the program um, is having what we consider the best the best uh, effect on, on reducing recidivism. We also have a program called Community Partners. We understand the importance of, of partnering with, with providers in the community. So part of, our, part of our function and part of our, our duty will be to reach out to those in the community who offer these services and link offenders up to the services that will best fit them outside of the centers that we operate. And that will be anything from substance abuse that we can't handle or, or after the fact mental health all the way up to job placement and most importantly job retention. So we have, we have uh, uh, programs that, that instill uh, employability skills, life skills training, employment placement, and again, most importantly, employment retention. We find that employment is, is a, a huge impediment to reoffending. So we're trying to get them jobs and keep them jobs, and we, we, remain, we remain engaged with them throughout the process. So your program will provide job placement for those? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Commissioner? Any other questions? I have one question. Yes, sir. On the, um, I, no I noticed that you emphasize the uh, cogn cognitive behavioral programs. Yes, Commissioner. How expensive are doing that type of programming and accounting, our size? Um, what we usually do is a tiered pricing model based on the amount of offenders who are placed in the program. Um, there are, there are no capital costs to you whatsoever. All the costs that, that are incurred um, are covered on a per diem basis per inmate. So the cognitive behavior therapy that we do, the life skills training, the, subs the licensed substance abuse counseling that we do in conjunction with the other programming. And, and again, the programming changes based on the risk needs factors that we discover. So no one case plan is the same for every single person. So there's, there's a basically a tiered pricing model for, for uh, you know, that, that we can implement, uh, again, with no capital outlay to you. We will take care of the facility. Um, and again, it, the cost for, for, for Cameron County will be, will be reduced because we already have an asset well, of facility. Yeah. Well, we know what it costs to, to incarcerate people already. I mean, that's a number that we deal with on a monthly yes, basis. Sir. So, but, so all of the cost for implementing your program includes the cognitive Correct. Part. 
It's a soup to nuts program. Right. Any other questions? No, I'm fine. Do I hear a motion to acknowledge? So moved. Second. Second by Commissioner Hernandez. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Adam carries. One, Thank you. Just one suggestion is I think they need to visit before the uh, judiciary, the panel of judges, yeah. and have them, you know, ask us to RFP what would best suit what they would like to see in the county. And, right. and I guess uh, on that note, y'all do the pre-adjudication and post-adjudication. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and because we have district judges, we also have magistrate judges that actually handle, and JP judges that handle the magistration process. Uh, and so if we're going to have people on the electronic monitoring uh, in lieu of incarceration pending their trial or their charges being filed, then it, it'd probably be a good idea to visit with those folks as well. Yeah, we, we discussed that at length with the, with the sheriff last week. We talked about the application on the pretrial uh, phase of the, of the process and, and how important it could be to divert folks, to help your jail of a crowding issue, to be able to divert folks or at least get the right information in the hands of the, of the magistrate uh, to make that bail and or detention decision a little bit easier. Um, and then again, having the ability to have the programming and the electronic monitoring equipment uh, available on the spot uh, to handle that population. So we're very, very well aware of, of that population. Very well. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Consent. Are there any items any member of the court wish to take out and discuss separately? I've been asked by legal to, um, to table item R and triple K. Judge, table um, items double E and double F. Double E and double F? Yes, sir. Double E. Triple K, you said? Yes. That's table. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? Judge, you said R and what other one? Triple K. So far, I've got uh, R, triple K, Double E and double F. The table. The table. I've got some to pull out. Okay. Item B. B is in boy. Item M. M is in Mary. P is in Paul. X. As in xylophone. Double B. Double. Double B is tabled. Double B. Double C. Double H. Double L. Triple C. Triple E. Triple G, Triple L, Triple M, Triple N, and Triple S. Okay, do I, hear, it. Do I hear a motion uh, to approve all consent items uh, with the exception of those that I've mentioned to be tabled and those that Commissioner Sanchez has elected to pull out? So moved. By Second. Commissioner Hernandez, saying by Commissioner Gatz. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Any aye. opposed, carries. Item B, consideration of approval and maintenance agreement with the Revenue Market Sync for maintenance of the parks toll collection system. Let me see. On this, um, I was just looking at the contract on this, and I know that legal signed off, but I was um, looking at the contract, and uh, Roman numeral number seven, I believe the contract should probably state that both parties should sign off on any changes. Uh, on Roman numeral six, uh, I don't think it's specific enough where it talks about um, 
the last day of the fiscal period for which appropriations were made without penalty. And on Roman numeral two, it says the county will not be billed for the resolution of problem that is obviously the fault of TRMI application program, bug or manufacturing error. The problem is obviously I think is a little vague and I don't know that uh, if we find a problem and it wasn't obvious up front, if we're gonna end up footing the bill for it because of that word obviously in the contract. Okay, let's address that to legal because they've approved the contract. I'm not sure what the question is on six. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Commissioner, what was your concern on number six? On number six, um, it says it specifically understood and agreed that in the event insufficient funds are appropriated and or budgeted concerning the obligations under this agreement on behalf of either party, then the party with the insufficient funds shall notify the other party and this agreement shall thereafter terminate and be null and void on the last day of the fiscal period for which appropriations were made without penalty, liability, or expenses to the party. And I don't think that clearly establishes the end of the fiscal period. Is it our budget year? Is it um, their budget year? Is it their month? Well, if we are the ones that don't have um, enough funds appropriated, it's for that budget year. It's our fiscal year, it's September fiscal 30th. Year. And, and what if it's there? Because it says either party. Do they have a time frame? I mean, what if they, for some reason. But they aren't paying us anything. We're the ones paying them. Well, right, but the obligations. If, if fiscally they have issues, monetary issues, then they have the right not to comply is what it, this, because this is not just to us, it's to both parties. Well, it's for the 12, it's only for 12 months, so it's for that year. Okay, well, if you're fine with it, I just saw that and it, it looked a little odd to me, but. And I can make the other change on seven. Okay. Okay, do and I, then do you on want number to two, I think we need to get rid of the word obviously. Yeah, I'll just eliminate that. Okay. And subject to those changes. Okay, moved by Commissioner I Sanchez, do I have a second? Second. By Commissioner Gotts, any further discussion? All those in favor, say by saying aye. The aye. opposed carries. Item M, consideration approval of the September, October, November, December 2011 reports. Is somebody from, well, that was your pull out. Is somebody from the district clerk's office here? Yes. Where? Uh, Elvira and Mari are here. Okay, Commissioner, questions? I didn't have any backup, so I didn't have any backup information in this item. It was submitted. The what? Okay. Did, it make, did it make the packet though, yes. Pete? Well, it's only Does, there, did anyone else get it? it? It was emailed. I it was emailed. So. Oh, okay, well, okay. okay I, mean, I, I didn't see it, that's the only reason. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. By Second. Commissioner Benavides and by Commissioner Gaza. Any further discussion? All those in favor, so by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, carries. Adam P, consideration authorization to add to evaluation committee the following. Debris management approval and disposal post-hurricane disaster operations. Item B, collection and characterization, packaging tra transportation disposal, and add evaluation from Beto Barrera Jr. and Charles Hoskins. The only reason I pulled that one, is there any reason that maybe Lewis Era is not on that committee? I think it would probably be good to have him on there. I have no idea why he's why Pete, he's do you want to add Louis? That's fine. Okay. With the motion to add Louis, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. By Second. Commissioner Sanchez and by Commissioner Gotts. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Say by, by saying aye. Any opposed? Carries. Item X. Consideration and possible approval of assignment of license agreement. Who's going to discuss that? Commissioner, you pull that one. Let me get the item. Give me a second. Oh. I pulled it because it's an assignment of an agreement, but I was noticing on here that it's a 40-year assignment. I'm not familiar what this is. Legal, you wanna go over it real quick? Yes, this is um, property that is owned by Mr. Johnson, and at the time he asked, it's, um, Pete, it's located at Los Indios, and, and he needed an easement or a right of access to his property that we allowed under the, the prior agreement, but also in that agreement, he was getting ready to sell the property or was putting it for sale and he asked that it include the, the ability to assign this um, and it. it would come before the court and that was agreed to. And so this is what his, he is per, uh, pending right now a, a sale of that land so he's asking for the court to approve the assignment of, this, of the permission, the access to the, 
to the property. So he owns property that the only way to get to it is through our county property? Yes. Okay. Over at Los Angeles Springs. Okay. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to approve? Okay. So moved. By Commissioner Gatza, do I have a second? Second. By Commissioner Sanchez, discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed, aye. item carries. Item double B, consideration authorization to amend the 2012 equipment list for parks. Question? Um, yeah, I was looking at that list and I just wondered, where, where do you need a $1,500 commercial glass door refrigerator? I'm just curious. <clears throat> that, that was approved um, at the last, at the last uh, um, when we presented it last time, but where we used it, the refrigerator is at the bingo hall. It's oh, okay. uh, for the winter Texans, for the bingo and for, for okay. activity. Okay, I just. Okay, do I hear a motion mm -hmm. to approve? So moved. By Second. Commissioner Benavides and by Commissioner Gatsa, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. carries. Double C. Consideration authorization to terminate contract number 2011C11341 with Joe Fortugno. He's a Blanca Park. Is there someone else that's taking over this that we had approved already? No, I'm gonna bring that next um, uh, February 16th to, re to have somebody replace it. Okay, so someone will be replaced. Yes. Do I hear a motion? Move approve. Moved by Commissioner Second. Sanchez and by Commissioner Gatz. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any aye. opposed, carries. Item double E, consideration and possible approval of a license agreement. Lonnie Hall, Center Director for Gary Job Corps. Who's is that? That's a table, I thought. Table. table. Double, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Double E and double effort table. Double H, consideration approved for the Sheriff's Department to accept a grant. The only reason I pulled this one is just so we make sure, I, I believe this last year we had some issues with the overtime uh, and how it was calculated to make sure that it's calculated correctly so the county doesn't have to end up paying out of pocket. We're, we're using the current uh, overtime pay uh, rate that the sheriff's office gave us. Okay, well, but I think this last year we had an issue, and Martha, if you can maybe clarify that. That's my only concern. I don't want to be midway through the year where we didn't use the proper calculations that the grant requires, and then the county has to pay. Or documentation. Right. Uh, we, we have uh, changed the methodolo methodology to calculate overtime, and overtime is paid uh, every 28 days. So uh, they are, we require them to work the 171 physical hours before they qualify for overtime pay. Okay, and so. so the Sheriff's Office has implemented that completely. Okay, and, and that was my only concern about doing this, because if not, then we have to hit general fund. Aside from that, is okay? All right, yeah, we'll motion approved. Uh, I have a question, Judge, if you don't mind. By Commissioner Sanchez, second by Commissioner Gatsa, discussion. Question. Have all the issues with the previous stone, what is this? Stone Garden. Stone, stone Garden. Garden grants of previous <clears throat> years in regards to pending um, amounts that are due or not due from the grant been resolved in favor of the county? Uh, except for that one issue regarding the overtime, but we have resolved it, yes. So all of the issues that we had previous to today in regards to whether or not some of our accounting, it was congruent with the state's accounting have been resolved? Yes, to my knowledge, yes. Okay, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, carry double L, consideration of, of approval of a resolution authorizing the DA's office to apply for a general victim assistant grant. Commissioner, you pulled that? Yes. Um, let me see what I was looking at. Oh, this grant, there's, there was another one that was approved, but th this one requires um, general fund match of 19,000. Is that part of your budget already for this year's budget? Is that yes, in there? It's been like that for about three years and the way that it's split, it's 80% from the grant and 20% match. And the match is split amongst the DA's office and the county. Okay, so, so that is already part yes. of your budget? Yes. Okay. And part of our budget. Right, but I just want so to make hear sure. a motion to approve? So moved. By Commissioner Sanchez, second, second by Commissioner Gatz. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by, by saying aye. Any aye. Those carries. Triple C? Let's do triple. I guess they're all related, Commissioner? Uh, Are they they're all travel little, issues? They're, they're all travel issues. Let me, um, then let me take triple C, triple E, and triple G uh, together. Okay. Um, the, the, this health department. Travel. Okay. On. Triple C, um, 
I, I know what Yvette's doing up there and, and I fully support what she's doing. I just had a um, question about for various of, of these trips, they use a health department vehicle and we don't end up spending so much on mileage, but on this particular case, we're paying $292 in mileage and I was wondering if there was a reason for that uh, uh, other than using the um, county vehicle. Not that I'm aware, sir. Uh, I know that Ms. Elena was traveling in her vehicle, but um, I can get a clarification on that. Okay, and I just, I don't know if, if we have uh, a policy that if they're assigned a county vehicle, they should use it or, or, um, or if not, you, because this, I don't think, this is general fund money. This isn't health department money, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, and so that's my only concern if, if we've already have money allocated for a vehicle and we can save that, then that's, you know, $300 that we won't have to be looking for come August or September at the end of the budget year when we're short. Okay. I think okay. you may want to verify, I think the reason was that the county vehicle that's assigned to them uh, was not reliable enough to drive to Austin and back. Okay. I think that was the reason, but if you can have to check, check it out. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, and it may have been that she had to travel before we could approve it. So she yes. took her car instead of the county vehicle? Yes. I mean, this was kind of a, was a, last, a minute. last minute thing. So, I mean, I understand just because it's hitting general fund, I think we need to be real careful and, and try to avoid that when we can. Because I do notice that other uh, travel that we're approving, like to go to Corpus and other places, they are using county vehicle. Yes. So that was just my only okay, question. Do I hear on a that. motion to approve so sub move. subject to subject. anything or just approve it? Uh, because I think the other ones were planned on time. This one was a last minute deal. This yes. one she's yeah. gone. Okay, do I hear a motion yeah. to approve by Commissioner Sanchez? Do I have a second? Second. By Commissioner Gatza. Discussion. All those in favor, same by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Item carries. On triple E and triple G, same thing? Um, hold on, let me see. This was just registration. There's no travel there. They're traveling to San Benito. No, it's in it's in San Benito. Um, no, the only the only thing I had a question about here is if we're letting them use our county facility. I mean, what it says here is they're giving us two for one. But my concern is if we're going to let them use our facility, um, I think they should allow any of our health department people to attend this um, for free. I mean, they're saving the cost of having to pay uh, rental somewhere of a room. And, and so my concern is, why are we even having to pay the $675, even if it's at half the rate? You know, we can bring this one back, because it's not till March. So let's go ahead, let me ask to table that item. And, it, you know, if you want, you want. One other thing also, Judge, is from what I read in this um, memo here, it looks more at animal cruelty investigations, and I, and I don't know if the health department does this or if it's more of like the sheriff and constable's office that do these investigations and file charges. That, that was my other question. Actually, we do do uh, investigations on dog bites, and we do help out with animal cruelty investigations, basically on the pickups of the animals. And, but we, they did recommend for us to invite the sheriff's department officers, so we went ahead and forwarded them a flyer. Okay, and, and that was my, my main concern really was if they're using our room and they're gonna make money by other attendees, I think they should let our people Can go Can you go free. back and just ask them if, if they're willing to waive any county employees that attend okay. for, in exchange for the use of the facility? I, I, think, I think that's a fair well, comment. Well, and I think that they're, they're giving us $675 for the use of the facility because they're charging half what they normally do. Right, well, but and that's only if we have people attend. If we didn't have people attend, can you go and do that? And let, let me ask for a motion to table and bring it back to the next meeting with, with some answers. By second. Commissioner Sanchez, second by Commissioner Gatz. Any discussion? All those in favor, send by saying aye. 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 Carries triple G. Health Department Office Staff Animal Control Officer Training Course. Oh, yes. Um, I, I asked to pull this one because the three people that are going that I notice here are the um, administrator, the health inspector and two health inspectors. Are these the people that actually 
um, do the animal control, they go out and pick up the dogs? No, actually, uh, Ms. Elena is attending because she's our local rabies control uh, authority, so she's going on that. Um, and the health inspectors are going, uh, because we're trying to get some of our staff cross-trained to help out with animal control. So we're starting to get our health inspectors uh, getting that basic training that's required before they do any animal control activity. Okay, and the other thing I noticed is, in reading that it says in Harlingen, in September 2012, they're gonna have the training here. So, would, would these people be picking up dogs between now and September, or might it, it save us $600 to wait till it comes to Harlingen? Well, I know that uh, right now we do have uh, one position open for animal control officers, so basically once we do hire for that one, we will need that person to attend, so hopefully we do get the approval so that we can send at least that person to the animal control basic training. Um, the health inspectors, we are getting trying to get them trained already, to help out already. Uh, Ms. Alina, I believe her her uh, certification expires in March, so that's why. Okay, she was well, and I can understand if she's the authority on the rabies, but if the other two aren't gonna be actually going out there and picking up animals, then you know why are we sending them? It doesn't okay. make sense to me. And if they're not gonna do it between now and September, well, they can attend the September training here in Harlingen and that'll save $600. Okay. Well, sir, uh, we can go ahead and... and That's also a March travels. So let's, okay. let's table Move that one table. and bring it back. And I think that um, uh, in anticipation of those types of questions, the have uh, Ms. Salinas respond to the commissioner in terms of why it'll Okay. Should be okay. And I'll just move to table I, by Commissioner Sanchez. Do I have a second? Second. By Commissioner Gatza. Discussion? One more time? I'm, I'm not picking on you. It's just typically we get to the end of our budget year and we're scrambling for money because we're out of travel money. And, and so if we don't carefully throughout the budget year look at these things and question them, then we're at the same issue comes August, September. Okay, okay. so don't, I mean, I'm not being no. personal with this. It's just. I got to do my job okay. up here, okay? Okay, no, that's okay. We'll go ahead and commit. Thank you. All in favor, signify by, by saying aye. 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 Opposed, carries. Triple L, Sheriff's Office staff, Carlos Gonzalez, travel to Round Rock, Texas. Um, okay, you can pull that one. That's, I, a, that's a ratification. They've already, they've already gone. Well, or they're about to go anyway. If you look at the flyer, it says February 3rd, Friday, from 9 to 11 or 1 to 3. But on the request, it's a three-day travel with two nights of hotel. Well, who's here to explain that from the sheriff's office? And it's uh, basically teaching how to eyewitness identification and lineup procedures. And you said the, the travel is, that can, maybe it's a typo or something. I'm not, I'm not sure. You wanna, that, that's, I'm just, So it has him leaving today for a meeting tomorrow from? Yeah, I mean, it's today one, he'll use it as a travel day. Okay, for tomorrow, a meeting from one to three, and then coming back on Saturday. So we pay tonight hotel and tomorrow hotel. Yeah, it starts at the uh, times at 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Or one to three. Or one to three. So if he's done at 11, he couldn't make it back tomorrow? All right, I can check up on that. And okay, see what the well, and I'm just, you know, is this general fund budget or is this? This is general fund budget. Okay. The training. Reserve training. Okay, so it doesn't impact. Okay, so but I, I just. Will, I will follow that up, uh, Commissioner. Okay, because to me it doesn't make sense to spend that much money for a two hour training. Three days for two hours. Well, our Carlos Gonzalez is, we have two trainers at the Sheriff's Office. He's one of our trainers, and, and uh, you know, I know that he wanted to attend this, this course so he can come back and, and teach our, our people here. Okay. And you know, that's the reason for, for his training. You know, we, we okay. I don't think, yeah, I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is the amount of time being spent away and getting for, paid for, for a two hour. couple of hour yeah, training. So that's the issue, not the, not the legitimacy of his, of his training. Yeah, so what do you want to do? You want to, because he's, he's going, well, or he's leaving, or do you want to not approve it? 
No, well, I'd approve, but like, if, if he's going to go today and spend the night, he can do the 9 to 11 training mm -hmm. and then drive back after 11. You want to authorize on one night? I'd move to authorize one night. Okay. I mean, unless you can give me a necessity of why he needs two. I, I don't have the, the, the course in front of me, but only what... Well, I think Papa Nose has a special on and, Friday night. Well, but no, because there's also another item on here for some tax, uh, tax office employees to go to a meeting at Cabela's in, in Buda, and they're going to go and come the same day. So... You know, okay, I have a motion to authorize one day, and I have a second to authorize one day. That's it, all right? Moved by Commissioner okay. Sanchez, second by Commissioner Gassa to authorize one day or one night's travel. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed, carries. Triple M, tax office staff, investigators Pedro Gassa and Joseph Sosa traveled to Buda. Uh, same thing. This is, um, and, and I pulled this one to basically to just to compare okay, you want to prove the, it then the, yeah i'll prove it but by commissioner sanchez second the second by commissioner gotza a little bit of further discussion and and basically this is a, a meeting that they're going to in Buta today uh and it's the um texas association of vehicle theft investigators south central region and so you know if we look at it we've got yvette that went to austin these guys going to Buta, and then um the the other deputy going to Round Rock. We've got three three sets of people traveling, but these guys are going to go and come in the same day. So really, the only thing that we're paying here is their their luncheon that, right. that they're so, attending. So you pulled it just to to make to, to, you compare. Know, to compare. Okay, I had a motion, a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Triple N. Tax office. Uh, tax assessor collector Tony Seguita and administrative assistant Rick Camarillo to travel to Houston, Texas on two twenty six two twenty nine. This one I pulled because it has two people traveling. Uh, the tax assessor is, I think, free or it's paid for, but the administrative assistant is not. And I'm wondering uh, what the need is for the administrative assistant to go. I think that's a good, I think that's a good question, Tony, because I think the appraisal district is paying for your travel, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And the uh, and I mean, the question is why why is your assist, why is Rick going? Well, the uh, the administrative assistant has has uh, has traveled to uh, these uh, conferences uh, every year to because we work on, on on a daily basis between the appraisal district and, and my office and and he's the one that that's the go between the appraisal district and, and my office and and. Uh, uh, besides, uh, Mr. Camarillo needs uh, some CEUs, and they're allowed to 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 get some. So he'll he'll get he needs hours. Oh yes. yes okay. Yes, sir. And the yes, 586 sir. is that for the course, or does that include travel? Does that include the cost of mileage? You going in a county vehicle? I believe. Or is that it, just the I course? I believe it includes everything. Yes. Sir. Okay. And if you're going together, I would just say that. I don't think we need to pay him mileage if the appraisal district's paying for you to go. He can ride with you. Uh, we can we can take care of that. We can, can carpool. Yep. Okay. Uh, I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Sanchez. Do I have a second so by Commissioner Benavides. Any discussion? All those in favor? Sign up by saying aye. Any aye. opposed? Carries. Triple S. Sheriff's Office Staff Lieutenant Daniel Huerta and Carlos del Bosque to travel to San Marcos on 3:27-3:29. Commissioner. Uh, same, th uh, this is another same issue. Um, there is a class on the 28th, and again, this is a three day um, travel item. And at least in my experience, it's typical if class ends at one, three, five o'clock, when class is over, we've driven back in the past whenever I've gone to, to seminars. Um, and so here, I'm wondering, is there a need for a second night? The last course is, uh, which one do you want? Uh, this is Triple S. It's a one-day course in San Marcos. So I can understand the, going the night before, attending the training, but then paying for a second night of expense in hotel, I don't ne believe it's necessary. And, and again, We'll have them drive back looking right, uh, right after the class. Uh, commission has OK, time. OK. Subject to that change, move to approve. Second. Moved by Commissioner Sanchez, second by Commissioner Gaza. Discussion. Just one question, Marta. 
when, when these travel items get to your office, I, I'd like for you or, or Javier to really look at this. All these points are, are, are valid points. It makes no sense to travel two nights for a one-day seminar. Normally, it's the night before, uh, and that's it, and they come back that, you know, that, that evening or the, that afternoon. So can you just do that? Have Javier check on the travel when it comes to that. Javier Villarreal. Javier Villarreal. And right. also, I'll, I'll check with, with our Well, people. the department head, too, but yeah, as we can see, sometimes, you know, things get by them, and, and that's why we, we need the, those second or fourth pair of eyes to, to look at it and scrutinize it. Sure. Uh, we can check them so long as uh, we have the backup when they take the agenda item to us for signature. Well, let me take it a step further. If the backup is not there, then you don't turn it in as an agenda item. So, I mean, the backup has got to be there because it's so not fair verify. to us to ask a lot of questions, we just got the backup and you don't know. So if, if the backup is not, and Pete, that's something that you need to monitor as well. Backup ain't there, you don't put it on. That's not our, that's not our fault, okay? And, and I know that some of these funds may be restricted funds, but there's still funds that we need to be careful about our spending, because if not, we end up in the same issue at the end of the year, we're short or we're having to, you know, look at alternatives. Uh, does that uh, requirement only reflect on the uh, affect the travel items? Because well, I, a, a lot of times no, we have. No, but but I mean I think you know we're getting we're getting a sense of, of what's com not coming in. So the travel items obviously are, are are an issue. But really any item should have all the backup. I mean we're getting items. You know we're getting like like we're getting emails the morning of the meeting, backup backup. Well that backup should be as as yeah. Pete as well documented uh, in prior years that that backup's got to be before you know, in our packets, not email 30 minutes before the meeting, because some of us may be on the road and not see it till we get here, or even, even then give a chance to, to look at it. So, Pete, not there, you kick it back. I mean, okay? Uh, I think, I, I, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, I referenced the, um, for example, the district clerk's reports. There was four months of reports that were being approved, and uh, those reports are probably in excess of 100 pages. They are available on the Odyssey system. So consequently, what, they've, what they emailed to the court was a summary report. And if the court you know, wants to see the actual No, that's fine. Well, so and, and there will be a difference there. The summary report is OK with me. Okay. The summary report is fine, but you get it into the packet you know, within the time frame that, that Pete's got to compile the agenda. And, and the only reason, you know, the constables and the JPs turn in their reports with the backup, and we're able to see, okay, this is what it is. But here I got one page, so how can I vote to approve something that, you know, I, right. I don't know what is there. All right. Okay. Along okay. the lines of uh, what Judge said, um, we need to urge all the department heads and all elected officials to make sure that when you want something on the agenda, that, you know, Pete's office isn't getting called at 3 and 4 o'clock. Uh, the following day after the deadline, uh, we we need to get everything in. You know what you need. You need to get it in to his office so that it can be put on the agenda. You know, and you're right. This is Agenda 101, and it you know we have a cutoff date, but you know, and maybe members of the court are guilty of it as well. You know, we have to have it on. There is a cutoff date to have everything in. Pete, what is that cutoff date for the meeting on like? Day. Today, uh, Thursday the three at three p.m. Okay, week. of last week. So all that information has to be in. If it's an emergency that's unforeseen, I can understand that. But Pete needs time to to compile that agenda. Um, so let's just keep that in mind as well, and just be strong and just you know throw it back at him. All right. Blame me. <laughs> Item four A: budget amendments, transfers, salary schedules. The uh, budget amendments, I believe, were placed in front of you. Um, the first one that you have is for the sheriff's uh, drug forfeiture fund. He's um, using $49,000 worth of uh, revenue that have uh, uh, forfeiture funds that have been received. Uh, then you have your line item transfers. Um, you've got some for district court, DA, the sheriff's office, uh, environmental health. Uh, for the, um, and then on the, toward the bottom of page two and page three on the line item transfers, uh, those are all uh, grant related and they are within the uh, grant guidelines. Uh, attached also you have salary schedules for uh, the DA's office for uh, general fund, uh, for fund 600 which is the pretrial diversion and for the forfeiture fund, uh, fund 900. Uh, they are all budget neutral for your approval. What are the changes there? 
on, on each. The salary schedules. Just out of curiosity. Um, there was a. Um, like 36, slot 36? Slot 36. Slot 36. Um, that position was reclassified from a secretary slot to an assistant DA slot. Okay. And uh, any other particular one you would like to know? Slot 90. Like, like 90? Doesn't have like. Slot 80? 90. 90. 90. Slot um, in the uh, 900 yep. salary schedule? Let me go there real quick. No, 600. I mean, why would we make that change? I'm not finding slot 90. What salary schedule is that on? On general page, fund? Third page. Third page of that same fund. DA. Okay. Yeah, third page. Uh, that is an investigator slot that has uh, been eliminated. Uh, if the court recalled that we had an agenda item, the DA's office had an agenda item on about two meetings ago where they were giving up one slot. So That's that change it. has been implemented. Okay. okay. And number 12 on the next. Uh, that is a position that was previously funded for 2081 and now it is funded at 4081 in the pretrial diversion. Okay. So that's an increase. Yes, of two thousand. But but it's within their budget. Yes, if you go to slot twenty three, that position was previously funded on the next page. It was previously funded at three hundred at three thousand, and it's now uh, going in at one thousand. One thousand. Okay. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Commissioner Second. Hassan. Second by Commissioner Sanchez. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Item carries. Claims. Claims. Uh, payroll dated February the 2nd for $1,616,658.03. Warrants number 273-164 through 273-919. Uh, I also like to read in a claim uh, additional uh, five claims. I do not know if you had the register put in front of you. We were having problems with uh, some of the, uh, with our system this morning. And uh, those are uh, inner fund transfers to fund uh, checks that have, that you have, or, that are up for your approval right now. That these right here? Yes, they should be loans to fund. Uh, could I see that real quick? I We, uh, no, those are the Caremark claims. There was a, there were five loan, five funds that needed uh, inner fund transfers to fund checks that have been written, and uh, I don't believe we were able to print the registers because we were having problems with the system. But uh, those funds do need to be deposited to cover the checks that are up for approval. Transfer from where to where? Uh, for fund uh, two one zero, which is the uh, law enforcement grant, also fund one nine zero, which is the law enforcement grant. Uh, we were funding those from uh, Fund 900, Fund uh, 250, which is the Victim Assistance Grant. We were funding that with a transfer from General Fund, which had been approved already for their fiscal year funding, and Fund uh, 420, which is the um, encumbered pretrial release. That was also a transfer from General Fund, which has already been approved in the fiscal year 12 operating budget. Fund uh, 460 is a juvenile services fund, and we had a um, loan from Fund 450, which is the juvenile probation fund. Okay, so these are funds already approved just to clear the actual checks that have been written? Yes, correct. Okay. Well, with that explanation, approval. I don't need uh, I'd also like to read in the ACH Caremark medical claims, which were $304,264.52 for your approval. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Gatson, I have a second. Second. By saying aye. Aye. Quick, aye. quick discussion. Item, item quick. carries. Please note my abstention on quick the affidavit. Quick discussion. I, I do have questions. Okay. Um, Martha, I was looking at this AT&T long distance on 00273348. What, what is this $5,000 charge under 408? Uh, and I'm just looking at the big ones because, you know, my recollection is long distance typically is a thing of the past. 
uh, with cell phones nowadays being local pretty much anywhere in the nation. So I was just wondering, what are those long distance charges? That is for the, that is the computer center department and uh, they are cost incurred for the, in the data processing system and the, uh, their usual So transfer services. of data? Trunk lines. Uh, Trunk lines, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, on the drug forfeiture, I saw a check for five million nine hundred and six thousand nine hundred and sixty-six. That's those are that's check number two seven three three seven three. Those were uh, funds that were awarded to the sheriff's department, and they were deposited in the in fund one two zero, the uh, auto task force, the federal task force grant. So we are transferring the funds from fund one two zero to the drug forfeiture fund, which is nine hundred. Okay, and looking at 00273440 general fund, there's an ACH unidentified for 392,000. What is that? Uh, what is the number, I'm sorry? Uh, 44. 00273440. Three, it's on page 16. I'm I, sorry, page 15. I saw that last night and I, let me see. You had the same question I did? <laughs> uh, yes, I did. And um, those were uh, an ACH that was received in the uh, WIC fund 320 and there were funds belonging to general fund. So we are transferring them to general fund. And where were they received from? From, they were received from the state comptroller. That were due to general fund? Yes. Okay. And the only reason I had a question, it said unidentified, so I'm wondering why. Unidentified. Right? Yes, that's yeah. the GL okay, account but, where they were. But I didn't know from where. Okay. Yes. And let me see if I had any other. I spend a lot of time highlighting. No, that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Item C, consideration approval of an order authorizing publication of notice of intention to issue COs and other matters related thereto. Pete. Judge and commissioners. We had a um, prepared a very nice PowerPoint presentation with aerial photos uh, of the of Meet the Switch Art, the West Rail Project, Veterans Bridge, and SH-550. And then uh, this morning, we're having uh, computer problems. And so I was not able to load them onto the laptop. Um, luckily, the, the other individual that was on the helicopter with me had some photos and put them in a CD. So this these are not the best slides, but uh, just want to give the court an update on a couple of projects that we're working on. But before I do, I'd uh, like to uh, acknowledge the presence of the chairman of the RMA, David Alex. Um, we also have with us our financial advisors, Noe Nojosa. Uh, later on, following me, will be Dave Gordon, who will make the detailed presentation um, on the financials. We also have our bond counsel with us, uh, Paul Martin and uh, Dan Martinez. Um, and our GEC um, with HNTB, Richard Writings. Um, this first picture is, um, shows SH-550. Um, see the portion that we've done, which will be the, the new entrance um, into the Port of Brownsville. Did Zahn take you in his helicopter? No. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you see Highway 48, and then on, on the west, you see 550. Uh, all the road has been cut already for the entire route. Um, this is one of the bridges. I believe in the entire project, there's like five different bridges, and this is one of them that's under construction. Uh, here you see a portion of it uh, that's already black top. Uh, 
This is the uh, switch yard in Olmito. Uh, as you all recall, we added an additional 36,000 uh, feet of um, rail capacity, and this is the completed portion of phase one. Phase two is under construction. That's actually a picture um, on the Mexican side uh, of the um, West Rail project. That's Mexico's portion of the bridge. You did take the picture from the American side, right? Yes, sir. We, we I'll put it this way. International we, airspace. We followed the curvature of the river. And this is the Veterans Bridge. Uh, you can see the portion on the U.S. side uh, it's pretty much complete. Uh, you all approved two agenda items today dealing with an amendment to the Coast Guard permit and an amendment to the presidential permit. Uh, that is to do a tie-in that will allow us to use our facility while Mexico uh, constructs their portion of the bridge. Mexico did put out their bid notice on the 26th of January. Their bids are due on the on the 14th of February. Uh, and Mexico will do something similar to, to what we did. If you all, some of you might recall that when we first opened the Veterans Bridge back in April uh, 30 of 1999, it did not include an overpass over International Boulevard. So the traffic at that point for about a year, year and a half, would come to a stop at International Boulevard. Um, it was about a year, year and a half later that TxDOT came in and put in that overpass. And when they did, our traffic went up by 23%. So on the Mexican side, what they're doing is they're not only including the portion of their bridge uh, in their bid notice, but they also included two overpasses along the route, uh, one of which will be, if you all are familiar with the Mexican side of the Veterans Bridge where Soriana is at, all that will be an overpass and it's gonna go connect to the loop um, to the inner loop that, that uh, services the city of Matamoros, and that loop connects to the outer loop. So uh, we'll have much better access when that project is completed. For those that dare to cross? Correct. Um, as I said, and, and I think I sent the court uh, those pictures of West Rail um, and Veterans Bridge that were a little bit better than this ones, but. I just kind of wanted to give the court a, a report. Um, the SH-550 project, the portion that is under construction today, uh, is about 70% complete. Uh, we're still looking at a December uh, time frame to complete that project, including, and, and one of the first pictures you could tell uh, that they're already working on the overpass over Highway 48. They're doing the temporary roads uh, that will serve as a detour for the traffic. Um, I also, you should have in front of you this, this spreadsheet, uh, but I want to go to the second page, um, which is a map, um, and the map. The reason we're here today is to request from the county uh, to backstop or issue debt on behalf of the RMA uh, for the SH-550 direct connector project. Um, and the second page, as I mentioned, um, is a map that shows the entire configuration of SH-550 from uh, US-77 to Highway 48. Uh, about a year ago, we received um, pass, or we were selected as one of the pass-through projects uh, by the Texas Transportation Commission, uh, and they awarded $27.7 million. We still do not have uh, an agreement, uh, but we've been negotiating um, as far as the terms and conditions have been pretty much negotiated, and we're still waiting to get a final copy of the agreement from TxDOT. Um, but that funding that we received um, could only pay for a portion of the project. Uh, the idea is to take the project all the way past Old Dallas and include an overpass um, on Old Dallas Road. This map shows the, where the, the direct connector project would begin uh, and where it would end, just past um, Baker Road. Um, and then from Baker Road uh, east uh, to just past Old Dallas Road would be uh, what we're calling the beginning and end of the SIP loan project. And what we've done since uh, the middle of September of last year, we approached 
uh, TxDOT staff in Austin, and we submitted a SIP loan application to cover the cost from just west, east of uh, Baker Road all the way to uh, past Old Dallas Road. And we've been, um, we've been exchanging information uh, with the staff in Austin since we submitted our application uh, back in September. We've gone back and forth, uh, provided different financial models, uh, a flow of funds uh, showing how uh, the debt would be retired. Um, but to this point, we still do not have um, a clear indication from TxDOT as to whether uh, they will proceed with the uh, processing of the application or not. Uh, that process is a pretty lengthy process that still lies ahead for us. It must go to the Texas Transportation Commission at two different meetings. Um, and even after that, there's agreements that need to be negotiated. So today, we're probably looking, if we go the route of the SIP loan application, we're looking at about um, a letting date of some time between July and September, uh, maybe even after those dates. So what we're going to do today is provide the court with two options. One option obviously being uh, going, continuing to the SIP loan process. And the other option is um, asking Commissioner's Court to issue the entire debt on behalf of the RMA. Um, that option has a lot of benefits um, for the RMA, um, and our financial advisor will go into detail uh, when he makes his presentation. Uh, but that's um, and, and, and we've been going back and forth, and about two nights ago, I called a financial advisor and I asked him to run some numbers, assuming the county would issue the entire debt so that we could compare. And, and as I mentioned, he'll go into that uh, detail when he makes his presentation. Then the third slide that's um, included in your packet is, is this one, um, and it's entitled Cameron County Regional Mobility Authority Funding uh, Secured. And that's a list of projects and the funds that we've been able to uh, to secure. Which, I don't have that one. It's an eight and a half by 11 that, that should be oh, in there. Okay, this one? Yes. Okay. That just shows the projects um, and the funding that we've been able to secure either through the state or uh, the federal government. Uh, okay. But we've added two projects in there. Um, two of the international projects that we're working on, one being the expansion of the Veterans Bridge and the other one, the West Road Relocation Project. We are coordinating the entire project. Um, and including working on the funding for those two projects. And so we were able to successfully, uh, successfully obtain $42 million for the expansion of the Veterans Bridge on the Mexican side. And again, that includes the expansion of the bridge itself and two overpasses, so that's why it's $42 million. And then um, obviously the, the West Rail relocation on the Mexican side, which is $65 million. And again, the reason that's much higher than our cost is because it also includes the relocation of the street chart from downtown Matamoros to the new uh, West Rail Bridge. Um, so just wanted to provide the court uh, with that updated information. Um, having said that. Um, Pete, Pete, I have a question. On the, West, on the Olmito switch yard, we have, a, or I should say I have, is in Precinct 2 a major concern with inbound traffic coming from north to south. Um, the train is having to, and you and I talked about this privately, having to stop and block off neighborhoods. And I've had people calling me now recently having to wait up to an hour, hour and a half for the train to actually move out of this neighborhood. There is no other way out of this neighborhood. It's a big neighborhood. It's completely blocked. There's a, uh, I was told by uh, Union Pacific people out of San Antonio that a switcher would be needed to complete that project. And I believe he told me it was uh, pretty close to a million dollars for that one piece of equipment. And um, he hinted that there was kind of the county's responsibility, and I don't believe it is. Uh, we need to be able to move that traffic coming in from north to south into that switch yard without having to stop that train and block neighborhoods. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense because that's an operation issue. Uh, I mean, the switch yard is, is right next to that area you're talking about. Um, um, not Morrison Road, but uh, Merriman Road. Mer yeah, Merriman uh, That is Butler in, Avenue. The yes, ba uh, Baker Road. Um, that's in Butler Road. Yeah. That's in close proximity to the switch art, so that there, there shouldn't be any excuse why they're staging their train in that area. But um, I do. there is a rep from UP from San Antonio here tomorrow, 
um, and I'll bring it up to his attention because that, that should not be happening. Uh, the switch art has plenty of capacity uh, to stage um, those trains. Uh, not sure why they're staging them there, um, but it, it just doesn't make sense. But it's an operation issue, and, and I mean, the infrastructure is in place, so I don't see why there should be any additional switches um, that are needed. I mean, they come in and out into the switch art today, so. Um, but I'll, I'll bring up that issue with that gentleman. Please, the, they, they did tell me that the engineer actually stops the train, gets off, has to turn the switch, then get back on the train and get it moving again. That's why it takes so long. See, before, and, and we've, we had that problem years ago prior to the expansion of the switch art because they didn't have the capacity, and so they would stage along their main line. Mm -hmm. But with all that additional capacity, that, that should not be, should be done. Thank you. Is that inside or outside of the Brownsville city limits? Um, is that, that neighborhood in be, the city that would limits? Be, that would be inside. Inside the yeah. city limits of Brownsville? Yeah, because it's right yeah. next to Expressway, so yeah. that's probably covered so by the city that, limits. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it serves an area that's outside, um, and there's like uh, probably five to ten streets uh, that just have that one um, so. entrance and exit off of uh, Merriman Road. Uh, and we've looked at, you know, see if we can provide any other access, and there's just no no other way, uh, but, but I'll bring it up with him tomorrow. Okay. At this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave Gordon, um, who will present the, the this formal This is still related to, to this agenda item, correct? To the SH-550 dirt connectors, yes. No, sir. but I'm saying item C, this? Yes. yes okay, sir. all right. Good morning, uh, Judge, members of the court. Noe Nojosa with the Stratton Hudson Company. Good to see you, and actually good to uh, to be here with you. I know I've been here before, but uh, way, way too many times. Way too many times, Judge. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, but in any event, Dave Gordon is with me. He's going to proceed and present to you the plan of finance, or what we call the the proposed plan of finance for now. What's important for you to note is that uh, although the project is viable, uh, we've been, as Pete has said, uh, the RMA has been working very diligently with this project over a few years, and. Uh, and when I share with them, Mr. Chairman, good to see you, David. Uh, uh, when I share with the court members about the project, I was very uh, inspired by the fact that they're in great support of the project. Uh, as anything else, the projects being supported by the county not only will provide for a, a better borrowing cost, better borrowing rates, but the fact is that the county could, could uh, expose itself to having to borrow money for another entity and, and to an extent, even sacrificing or exposing its credit capacity. Uh, you know, there's only so many things that the county can do or any political subdivision can do and not think that you will not be exposed. What's important for you to know as policymakers and being your financial advisors, the fact that if, if you go about borrowing money, currently you got three rating agencies that have an opinion on the county's debt. Uh, one of them, and we all know, is Moody's, and Moody's rates the the county at an A1. And in the scale of ratings, the highest rating that you can have is a AAA rating. And I think the U.S. government still continues to have the AAA rating from Moody's, uh, probably on a negative outlook, though. Uh, today, you're at an A1, meaning that you're below the AA category. And, uh, and although you're A1, Moody's still considers you stable. So in other words, uh, if you go about borrowing money, uh, Moody's going to have an opinion about you that says you're fine, you're, you're in a good position. Uh, the things that I observed in the rating reports uh, based on the previous financing that you did last year, someone that never about $27 million, uh, Fitch, which rates you at a double A minus, and Standard & Poor's, which rates you at an A plus, both uh, made some serious observations about the fact that the, uh, the county over the last three or four years had been uh, basically uh, eroding parts, parts of the savings account. What's important today, and I, I want to commend you for it, is that in 2011, based on preliminary estimates, the 2011 fiscal year apparently has turned around that savings account, uh, where I think based on coverage that I have with Martha just briefly, apparently the expected fund balance for this year is going at six million one, a turnaround from a previous year, I think, of about five million five or thereabouts. So, just listening to the court earlier, 
and the fact that you're so engaged even what, in what I think are micromanagement attitudes, uh, the fact is that you are very cognizant of the fact that you're making a better and greater effort. And I think that's going to be recognized by the rating agencies. So when you look at the opinion, uh, the independent opinion of these rating agencies as it pertains to debt, debt, just to give you a perspective, the county today, you have about $80 million worth of outstanding debt supported by about $16 billion of property values, meaning that the debt that you have outstanding being paid by property taxes or property tax base is about a half of a percent. Counties normally can get away with 1% to 1.5%. Now, in your case, when people look at your ratings, when they look at your financial condition, they're not only looking at the county, they're also looking at overlapping jurisdictions, i.e., City of Harlingen, City of Brownsville, the navigation districts, the school districts. So they put all this, all these various political subdivisions, and they look at the well of property values. And that $16 billion literally supports debt issued by these various political subdivisions inside of your county. So when they look at the county, they don't expect you to be at 5% of TAV or 3%. They expect you to be somewhere in the neighborhood about one and a half percent. You well below that, below that. So if you were to go about <coughs> adopting a project like the RMA, in our gut, we don't believe that having to borrow money for the benefit of the RMA is going to expose you that significantly to a credit downgrade. I think what, what may be a downgrade may be more how you are are dealing with the everyday or day-to-day -day operational cost of the, of the county. But as I said earlier, I'm encouraged to hear that th that trend at least has been turned around in terms of fund balance. They, uh, so when I come here today, I, I came to impress upon you the importance of that. Two is that, uh, as you all know, federal governments, federal budgets, state budgets, they're all being constrained. Uh, costs are are, I mean, actually, everybody is looking at, 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 at cutting costs here and there. And it's, it's obvious that TxDOT, although it's been a good partner through the process, um, there's been a change of, of policy in terms of how they want to participate. In fact, Dave is going to share with you how we think you can go about attacking the project. What I, what it, when they presented to me the project, it became pretty apparent. It reminded me, Judge, of when we did the uh, Los Indios project, and we're going to do it on a revenue bond basis. And as a judge back at the time, I think I said, and you may have been there, Commissioner Garza, uh, no. instead of doing revenue bonds, let's do a CO. And the fact of the matter is that a CO gives you local power, local control. And I told Dave, look, I think that if the county is going to go out and, and uh, I guess, present its credit for, let's say, for, for the sun, uh, let's make sure that we have a, an established understanding of what we believe is fair for the county in its attempt to, to put its credit on the line for them, that at least we have three fundamental things. One is that as the RMA goes out about charging or levying a toll out there, that those rates come also before you for your consideration or maybe consent. That's something, Judge, in the court that that it's up to you to think whether you want to do that or not. It is, there are a lot of policy issues that you have to make that we have to bring to you as considerations. It's up to you to, to make on those decisions. But we think it's fair when we look at other entities across the state as they work with other enterprise funds, as the RMA may be considered an enterprise fund, that when you go out and, and step up and, and lend your credit, that it's not unfair to say, hey, let me check about how much you're raising on rates. Because at the end of the day, rates is what makes the project viable or unviable. And you certainly want to have something to do if the project's becoming unviable and rates are not being collected at levels that could protect you from, from them being able to pay their debt. Two is that although this is one project, this is one project of many other projects. I think the RMA is doing a very good effort of, of making sure that they prioritize on the importance of other projects, i.e., the Causeway, uh, and there are others that, that come, don't come to mind right now. But frankly, as they go about borrowing money, if they're going to borrow money for other projects, is that they come before you. If you're going to step in to borrow money for them on this project, that in the future they must come to you to borrow money, whether it's even on a revenue bond basis. Because at the end of the day, if this project is successful, as we know and we suspect strongly 
they will, that they have an obligation to you in coming to you and saying, you know what, I think I'm going to do the west, is it the east loop or east loop or, or the causeway, they need to have an obligation to come to you and say, you know, we, we can afford now to do on a revenue bond basis, what do you all think? And, and I think that creates accountability to you and you are, I guess, for all practical purposes, protecting on a fiduciary basis the credit of this county. So the second thing, again, like I said, one is, is looking at rates, two, issuing a debt, additional debt in the future. And then three, that is not uncommon, just like when we did the project on Los Indios and we did the project on Veterans Bridge, that in this case, you should have a right to an extent to demand for some revenue sharing if the project is successful. Kind of like you do with Brownsville and Harlingen and San Benito on those two other bridges that, uh, that you, you get something in return. Uh, I think in talking to Mr. Sepulveda, and I haven't had a, the privilege of talking to Mr. the chairman and the board of the RMA, is that I think it's, those are three fair things that you should, you should request or consider asking for in lieu of you stepping in. So again, uh, I'll stop right there. I'll entertain any questions. Uh, certainly, I, th I think that Dave should come in and, and, and make his presentation, and then we can engage in, in a little question and answer session if you want. Any questions of Mr. Hinojosa right now? No. Okay. Dave. You're, you're speaking to us as the financial Cameron Court. County Commissioner's Court financial advisor right now. That is correct. What sir. you told us, right? That is correct, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just before you step off, yes, sir. These, th this obligation, this debt, if the RMA were not to pay it off, then it would fall upon the county. That is correct, sir. Okay. Dave? Dave Gordon with Estrada Hinojosa. Uh, uh, Pete did a great job of laying out kind of the general project. I think you guys are all very familiar with it. Uh, Noe just did an excellent job of kind of characterizing some of the credit considerations for the county and some of the importance of the project. What I wanted to do was then was lay out the plan of finance that we've been looking at, that we've been pursuing, and an alternate plan of finance that we feel has a lot of benefits for the county and for the RMA that we would hope that you would act upon today and go through those details, get everybody comfortable with them and, and answer any questions that you have. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was, was share with you just the, uh, the estimates of the preliminary uh, cost of the project. And one of the reasons that we're here discussing today to have the, the county do the entire project. We didn't get this, what you're presenting beforehand, right? Or I mean, or like. You, everybody has, should have a copy. We have it here? Oh, this one right here. Thank you. So the, the, the cost of the project, um, as estimated back um, earlier last year, uh, was approximately $47.6 million. Uh, through some revised estimates that HNTB, the, the GEC for uh, Cameron County RMA has, has put forth, uh, the estimated cost now is about $40.3 million. That factors into certainly the, the viability of the project overall, so I wanted to bring that to your attention right from the beginning. Um, as I mentioned, there are two different plans of finance that we're, being, that we're focused on. One relies upon a, a SIB loan that, uh, that uh, Pete um, spoke about, it would be a loan from TxDOT. We've been pursuing that loan since uh, about August of last year, gone through a number of different iterations, and, and had hoped to have that on the agenda for the Transportation Commission meeting in February. It looks like at this particular point they will not uh, bring that forward. And uh, it, as Pete mentioned, if we go with the route with the SIB loan, it's likely that we will, we will have a, a letting on the project um, as late as somewhere in July to September uh, if we were um, ever able to ultimately secure that loan. Do you need an investment grade study done to be able to secure that loan? If we went to the public bond markets, we would need an investment grade study. No, but for a SIB loan? Uh, no, depending upon the specific conditions. Um, they haven't asked for that yet, but they also haven't given us the 100% the go ahead on the SIB loan. Okay. Uh, so what we, what we look here then is an alternate plan of finance, which would have the county um, supporting all of the debt. Uh, Noe's laid out some of those conditions, and I'll go through those in a minute. Uh, one of the things that's made it more viable for the county to do this as a standalone instrument is that, as I mentioned, the estimated costs of the project now are $7.3 million lower. Additionally, we were able to receive a, a $5.6 million um, contribution from, at least here, the MPO, but it's really from TxDOT directly, which again makes the project more viable. So I'm going to, th there's a lot of numbers here and some flows of funds and things of that nature. What I'd like to do is just kind of go through them and, 
And I think uh, I've answered probably most of your questions, but if there are detailed questions on some of the numbers, then by all means, uh, you can ask those. Um, Commissioner Garza, in addition to that sheet that you're looking at, uh, when we get to the actual numbers, there's some sheets that have the print a little bit bigger, so if your eyes are like mine, you can see those a little bit better. Um, the, the initial plan of finance, the one we've been working on, again, um, contemplates both the SIB loan and COs from the county to support the debt. Uh, there are four basic um, revenue sources that the RMA has that we're focused on. And if you look at this flow of funds, it attempts to kind of describe those. Uh, if we started the upper right-hand corner, again, SH 550 is a toll road. Uh, there are there will be uh, revenues generated from that road. We have a, a, a study from CNM Associates that describes what they project the revenues will be. We also have additional studies from HNTB that describes what they think the projections will be. Um, ultimately, the road will produce, you know, whatever the road will produce. Um, from those toll revenues, we would subtract that operating and maintenance expenses uh, for the operations of the road itself. And then the, the difference would be used to pay for, in this particular scenario, uh, the SIB debt service. Uh, we'd also established a rate stabilization fund, which is basically a fund that would be, um, uh, there, there, we would accumulate mon money into a, to a certain amount. In this case, um, it was proposed to be about 1.6 million that would basically be used to kind of offset any you know, increases and decreases in, in revenues to kind of smooth things out over time. Um, also, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, the who, second... Who is in control of the rate stabilization fund? The, uh, well, that's, one of the things is we're going to get to the end of this is that... Oh, well, um, I'm sorry, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Go ahead. You know. uh, the, the second revenue source is the vehicle registration fee. As you may recall, the, the county levies on behalf of the RMA a, a fee that is up to $10. Right now, we're at the statutory limit of $10. Those revenues are then remitted uh, monthly by the county to the RMA. The RMA has to use them by for, um, for transportation projects. As you may recall, we issued about $28 million worth of debt last year that is secured a, on a senior lien of those revenues. And so th the funds from, from that um, bond sale were used to advance the SH-550 project and pay for certain portions of the, of the, for example, the toll collection equipment on the gantry that's already open was also used to advance other projects. So is, there is a senior lien already on that debt. So um, regardless of, of either scenario, uh, we're going down the lien level in terms of, of that. Um, if you then look on the left-hand side, the, the two other th um, uh, sources of revenue that the RMA has that they'll be pledging to, to one or both transactions <clears throat> is the transportation reinvestment zone. You guys brought this issue up uh, recently. Uh, as you know, TXP did a, a very detailed study as to what revenues they thought the uh, transportation via investment zone would produce. Um, additionally, the county recently acted and agreed to contribute 100 percent of that increment above the base value to the, the RMA to support these various projects. That revenue source, as you know, is um, this year is the first year that the county will that the the, the, the RMA will get approximately sixty thousand dollars, I believe, from that revenue source, and it certainly will grow. Uh, considerably over time. And then the final source that Pete mentioned earlier is the pass-through toll revenue. Uh, the pass-through agreement is for $27.7 million from TxDOT. It will be paid over a period of from approximately 13 to, to 23 uh, years. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. Um, those funds um, are through a, a contractual agreement with TxDOT. And as Pete mentioned earlier, he's, they're about ready to finalize that, that agreement uh, with TxDOT. So under this particular scenario, basically uh, the, the vehicle registration fee and the toll revenues would be pledged to the SIB loan. Whatever flowed through from those would also be pledged to the COs and then in addition to the transportation reinvestment zone and the pass-through toll revenue. What is a county taxes little box on the bottom? As um, Commissioner Sanchez inquired about a minute ago, um, these would be certificates of obligation. We expect fully that the revenue sources, the four revenue sources that I outlined, would be sufficient to pay for the debt service on, on the obligations as well as fund all of the reserves that we're going to talk about, the rate stabilization so fund. those are the COs. Th these are COs, yes, exactly. It's not the COs. taxes, it's COs. They're COs. So that means that you, there would be a tax pledge from the county. An obligation of the county to increase their tax rate to respond to the CO. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, basically, you're like the dad. In case 
he can't Junior perform, doesn't pay. You have to step in. The way we are controlling that effort, one is, uh, and Paul, help me out. Are you Paul here? Oh. Oh, David. Um, basically, what we have in, in the CO uh, indenture, I believe, is to have the ability to have this rate of stabilization fund. We're going to have a reserve fund, too, for cap I. Well, the rate stabilization fund would act as a reserve fund. There's also a, a repair and replacement fund. So there's two funds in, in addition to cap I. So before you get hit, there are other funds set in place that will be, one, be funded up front, another one be accumulated, so that as the, as the project, let's pretend that the, the project, like the bridge system, sometimes they don't perform, you got other funds that will step in before he comes to the county. You follow me? Right. So that, so that you'll never be in a position to have to react without at least six or a year notice that, A, we have to step in. When you step in, though, uh, it will have to come from other enterprise funds or, at the end of the day, the bondholder, the fellow who's lending you the money, the fellow who's buying the certificate, expects you to make an adjustment to the tax rate. To we make the money. payment. Exactly. And that was, that was my question a little bit earlier is who's in charge of the rate stabilization fund? Because if, if we have no oversight over that fund, how can we make sure that it's dedicated in that manner before coming to us? That's why I suggested, when you asked me earlier about what hat was I wearing, the hat is, I think it's fair that you keep an eye, just like a pizza pool that the county goes on presents to the cities, about how the bridge systems are performing during the course of a given calendar year, you should expect the Army to come to you and give you a report. Here's how we're doing with our rates. Here's what we're doing with the rate stabilization fund. Here's what we're doing with reserves, so that you don't be surprised. So it's not, it's not necessarily an uncommon practice. It's more common than we think. But I think from our perspective, when you look at the benefit that the RMA is going to have, and at the end of the day, what the project is going to give this county, this region, is that instead of having to borrow for a project at rates of 5.1 percent or rates uh, because a SIB loan is going to cost you about 5.2 percent. If we get it. <laughs> if you get it from TxDOT with a lot of other caveats uh, or conditions and then you go and step in for a piece of it. When you combine those payments over the life of 30 years because a SIB loan will give you more flexibility so you can go out there and extend your debt to 30 years if you need to. The payments annually are about two million seven. If you do it for them over twenty five years, they're two million eight. But the interest savings are actually about thirteen million dollars by you stepping in to do it all locally versus helping help, having them help you out. From our perspective, we don't want you to get to get to exercise that backstop. In other words, stepping in for them. What we're trying to do is build a structure that gives you optimal, optimal flexibility up front and during the course of the project so you don't have to face that backstop. Because at the end of the day, what we want is to create a system that as they go up and do other projects, this project will generate history. What you don't have today is history, right? This is a new project. It's a new end Speculation. Well, that's so, why I asked about the investment grade that's study. That's exactly right. You know, because right. Yeah. So, so in three or four years, or even five, which is the ideal time to have history, then we're going to go to the rating agencies and say, you know what, we're not doing CEOs. We can do revenue bonds. Or we can say at that time, you know what, why do revenue bonds? We can continue to CEOs because we're going to save interest costs to the RMA. And at the end of the day, you may end up doing all the projects because of the ability to, of the county's, uh, 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 the flexibility the county's credit has on its, on its own. Now let me ask you this. You mentioned right now on a SIB loan, the, Tex the Texas Transportation yeah, Commission Texas, Texas. Um, takes part ownership. Did you say that or did I misunderstand no, you? No, I didn't say that. But they okay. There were conditions. There would be conditions. Okay, okay. There will be conditions that if they come in and help the RMA, that the RMA will have some ownership. That the, the, the RMA has to be protected, right? And the county will be limited as to how much they can impose on the on the RMA. Okay, so. and then I guess now going in the other direction, let's just say the RMA doesn't come up with their payment. Yes. And it falls back on the county. Mm -hmm. What what recourse do we have in ownership of that roadway, uh, and to what extent? Yeah. Uh, well, 
from my uh, limited uh, uh, legal experience, if, I mean, I know you're an attorney, I, I suspect that when the county goes out and does this borrowing, the asset itself needs to be in the name of the county. I, am I correct in saying that? It's ours so, from the beginning. Till the so day. you, in essence, become an owner of that highway. At the end of the day, though, we want the RMA to be successful. Oh, sure. And I suspect that as we go about paying off that debt, that then the county will say, here's your project. Go run with it. Because at the end of the day, you want the RMA to not only manage that SH 550, you want the RMA to do the other projects. Continue and improve. Correct. Right. Now I just, but to the taxpayers, I need to tell them, hey, we're backing you up because we have something here. Yeah. It's not like we're borrowing money and you know, for nothing. And, and, Commissioner, and, and the beauty about the county in this case, this is not the first time the county has done that. As Judge Coscos will tell you, we've done this on this court before. We did that for Los, Los Indios Bridge. And well, I don't think we did it for the Veterans Bridge, but, but I know for Los Indios we did. But we step in, knowing how well the system was doing, why do we pay a bondholder a higher interest rate on a revenue bond basis when we know the project is going to be better? And thus, if it's better, then I get more, meaning you get more, from those surplus revenues. And that's what we're trying to do. And how did Los Indios work out? Los Indios worked out very well until just recently that, that I mean, at first it was, I mean, I think we spent like six or seven years thinking, when are we going to generate revenue? When are we gonna gener and, then, and then we went through this boom time. And now, until the last two or three years, it's been a struggle. But at the end of the day, I think the county's vision, and, that's, and I think that's being shared today with the kind of project you're undertaking, is to figure out how the county continues to be regionalized. And that's what the RMA intent has been. Yeah, but it, it, it's, a, I mean, it's a little bit different. I mean, the, the Los Angeles project, first of all, you know, did have some history behind it in terms of the bridge system. So there was a track record there utilizing the bridge system. We had a, a known commodity, which was Gateway Bridge. So, so this is a little bit different in, in not, not really knowing. Like, you know, there right. is no track record, but it's the same, it, 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 in the spirit of things, it's the same theory. Concept. But yeah, the same concept, but in the, in the Los Indios Bridge, uh, that, that was a bridge uh, it, it, that would be a future bridge to generate some revenues. But, but there was a backing through the bridge system that, that's at that time was very, very successful. Th that's correct. And I think, as, I think the objective here is, A, we have a startup project. As Commissioner Garza says, in order to do something for a startup project today on a conventional basis, you got to have this investment grade rating uh, a study. And, and today, it's just very challenging to do what we call greenfield projects. It's a new project. So it's a question of, at the time when we did Los Indios, the question of if you believe that the project is going to be successful and you have something to back it up with, as in that case, the Gateway Bridge, we backed it up. And property tax at the time were, you know, backed up the system, backed up the Los Indios Bridge. Here, we don't have, we don't have anything. But what we do have is the vehicle registration fee. We're going to get pass through toll. Yes, I mean, you're right, Judge. That this is a new project. It's a greenfield project without that history. But when we look at the four revenue sources that are being pledged, uh, the vehicle registration fee, for example, is a very known quantity. Um, it's, it's a very robust revenue source. It's grown um, at an annual growth rate of 3%. Even without growth, it would still be a robust revenue source. The pass-through toll revenue, is, as uh, Noe started to mention, is going to pay for approximately 40% of the debt service. That is basically, once, once the project is open, that's a contractual obligation with TxDOT. Uh, then the, the transportation reinvestment zone, that obviously you do have to have a growth to get that revenue source, and then finally the, the toll road itself. So the toll road, if we were only looking to the toll revenue, then there would be much more risk involved because it is a startup project, there is not that history. But we're looking to these other revenue sources, some of which are very robust. I mean, just think about it like this. You're gonna borrow, let's say the $40 million. You're gonna have a two million eight payment. But you got four sources of revenues coming in. You have the vehicle registration fee, which translates to about what? Today, two million six. Well, at, at, two, at two million six. Okay, but out of that two million six, how much is paying that twenty-eight million dollar okay. debt? In fact, if you go over to page uh, um, page six, on that page six, uh, go ahead. Dave. 
If we look at, it, we kind of skipped over one scenario, but quite frankly, that's not the scenario we're recommending anywhere. I think it's better to focus on this one. Um, I'll, I'm going to back up for two seconds. Uh, if, we, if we look at this particular scenario, um, in case B, we're saying basically all of those revenue sources would be focused on the county um, and we would not have the SIB loan. Um, I've kind of described each of those revenue sources. Now let me go through actually kind of what they are in the spreadsheet themselves. But again, we would have the four revenue sources, the vehicle registration fee, the transportation reinvestment zone, the pass-through toll revenue, the toll revenue itself from the toll road, and then the various funds. And to kind of get to your question, Commissioner Garza, about you know, who would control what, there's going to be an interlocal agreement between the county and the RMA and those conditions would be stipulated in that interlocal agreement, and so you would have an opportunity to, to you know, to weigh in, have input. cast your vote, have your input. Or that part has not been completely worked out, and I think what you want is you want to make sure that the county is, is, is protected, but you probably also don't want to make sure that you're having to deal with certain issues on a daily basis. So that, whatever those conditions are that you agree with with the RMA, those would be in that interlocal agreement. Um, if we look at the spreadsheet that uh, we just discussed, kind of go through these from, from the left to right, um, again, um, on column A there, we have the toll revenue itself from the toll road. We do have one gantry open, as you know, that's already generating revenue. We have another gantry that's under construction that's at the port that will be generating revenue in, in uh, December. So those, those have revenue. What they don't have is a complete road, really. So, you know, if you drive on those, you're kind of driving on piecemeal road. Once the direct connectors are open and the entire road is open, then we'll have, obviously, revenue across that entire piece, which would be substantially more than individual pieces by themselves. So we have in column A there are the projections from, uh, from CNM. We're taking the lower end projections from CNM versus, versus higher projections from HMTB. Uh, that's a net of the operating expenses for the road. Um, and then you can see um, the vehicle registration fee that we were starting to discuss next. You can see based on, um, as Noe mentioned, $2.7 million. In, in projected revenues for 2012. Um, and if you look at the debt service itself there in, in the next column, you can see then after that in column, this labeled B, what it, the net is after the debt service. And that, that was your question, Commissioner Sanchez. And Commissioner, and just so you know, in that part, in that column that is outlined, that's your mortgage payment on the license plate fee revenue bonds that were sold two, three years ago, I guess. One point. And the <coughs> highest, One point five six. Yeah, and the highest payment of that loan is back in the back end is about a million nine. Today, you're generating about two million seven. Okay, when we talk about robust, we think that the revenues in that category are going to grow at a rate of what? Three percent. Three percent. Three percent. So as years continue to elapse, the county continues to elapse or uh, to, uh, uh, to grow. You're going to have that revenue stream generating net net over its mortgage payment about a million dollars, okay? Today you generate a million dollars. So you got this license plate fee that's gonna, is gonna generate a million dollars. On top of it, the column before, right column A, that is the expected toll revenue. Which will increase. Which should increase. Uh, we, in fact, if you look at the first years, we are estimating for 2012, for the year that we're under, $320,000. Where are you today, Pete? Is that a good number to play with? Uh, that you will have 320. He Where said, are yeah. we today, Pete? Give me a number. Come on. <laughs> but we're not in a complete year. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, and, you know, keep in mind we only have one gantry open. Really, what needs to happen is, you know, have the entire. We need the whole road done. Exactly, you know, because that's when we're going to get a good feeling. But um, we're, we're about to enter a, a, an aggressive collection uh, program because we've got, you know, quite a bit of money outstanding. So the next phase is to go to JP court and start collecting. So uh, now let me ask you this. Are these projections, were they based on the road being completely open yes. or just those gantries? No, that's, that includes the ramp up, but I'll let Richard. Uh, what, what it says here is in 2012, we have one gantry open. That's at 1847. So all of these reflect that uh, in 2012, the only gantry we'll have open generating that $320,000 is the one at 1847. You go down to the next column, it's got 2013, that's uh, $590,000 of revenue. We'll have about eight to 12 months of the gantry in 2013 
that's down at the port on the port spur that will be complete in December, then we will begin to have that revenue flowing in as well. So that gets you up to the 590 and those two ramps or those two tolling locations will grow to 740 by 2014. And then in 2015, we will have the uh, uh, direct connectors to 77 open at that time. That's why you see the big jump there is because then people can go from South Padre Island to Harlingen uh, or to the port, uh, from Harlingen to the port without stopping. There'll be no red lights, no nada, and be able to uh, significantly be begin to increase these revenues. But that's based on the uh, CNN projections, the lowest, worst case possible. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you, sir. Except for the issue about the actual uh, amount of tolls collected to this point, the number. And I think Pete didn't have that number, no. right? Yeah, I think tolls collected uh, probably about 100, 140, 150,000. As of right now? Uh, right. That's and how much outstanding? Tolls. Outstanding when you include tolls and fees, probably about 600. Whoa. Okay. Yes. Um, does Tony have those in the scoff law? Not sure. Uh, would they qualify for scoff law? They should be able to qualify, yes. Let's okay. hope so. Yeah, yeah our, our next step with the collection companies is to go to the JP court, uh, which is the same pattern that CTR may um, have done in the Austin area. And they've been pretty successful um, at, at, I'm not sure what their collection rate is, but you know, it should be at least a good 70, 75%. The j and filing civil suits against these people? Yes. What about the court costs? Are you going to be paying all those court costs to file the suits and serve them? Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, how that works because we haven't gotten there, but. I, I can just tell you how it works all over the rest of the country and the court cost is applied to the uh, fees. Whole that the person then has to pay. The court cost is uh, borne by the person who did not pay the toll in a timely manner. But up front, you have to pay for it, right? Yes. I mean, you have to go through the court process. It has to be adjudicated. Uh, and for those who have been uh, uh, found remiss in paying their toll, they also have to pay the court cost. Exactly. Okay. Commissioner, I can tell you that in many times, you know, in fact, all the time that I know of when we have to sue somebody, we don't pay court cost. Now, if it, so if we are the enforcement well, but arm of it, then, then we probably wouldn't have to incur those court costs. But we, the county, or the RMA? Because well, this is see, the that, RMA. That's a question. You know, and, and that's why I say if we are the enforcement arm, we shouldn't have to do that. But this is new. You know, you know, we haven't been down this path before, so I would want to double check all of it. But I don't think we would have a court cost uh, issue there. Okay. And, and the reason I, I bring that up is if we do enter into this, we can make it part of the interlocal that we will be part of the enforcement because uh, a justice court has a requirement to collect court costs for any civil suit filed. So that's what I'm saying. The RMA would have to pay the court costs up front if they're the ones filing the civil suit to collect. This but if, if this is a county enforcement yeah. through the interlocal, then we may be able to avoid having to pay that court cost. Does that the court include, cost goes to the state, not. Does, does that include? county suits in JP court? The pain of the court yeah, costs? Yeah, in the past, do, do you recall any any time when the county has done that? I've, well, I never had a county yeah. file a suit in a JP court, so yeah. I don't recall that. But I do know that if it's the RMA, they're an independent entity, they're not a county, uh, they would probably be required to pay the we, filing. We would fee. have to look into that, but I, I think you know that, like I say, if we actually have to file a civil suit, we can probably avoid paying those costs if right. it's us. Right. So I think I'm just saying, food for thought, or making yeah. it part of this interlocal, that part of this enforcement, because we're again to what Commissioner Garza talked about uh, on the oversight and and the implementation and enforcement. If the if the county's made part of that, then that could possibly allow us not to have to pay those court costs up front. 
we, we we'll need to look into it, but I think I don't think we'll have an issue there. Okay. Uh, the the next revenue source, if there's no questions, uh, more questions on the vehicle registration fee, is the transportation reinvestment zone. Again, we talked about that. You know, the nature of that particular revenue source is that it is going to be small in the beginning, and in the end, you know, 20 years from now, that probably will be a very large revenue source. But it relies on property value growth within the transportation reinvestment zone itself, and. And you guys recall, I think relatively recently, uh, you, you adopted uh, contributing 100% of that. So that is a revenue source that is less known now, but certainly later will be a much more substantial revenue source. Uh, the final one we mentioned is, is, that, the, is that C? That is C, yes. And then the next one is the, the pass-through toll revenue. Now again, as, as Pete mentioned earlier, we have an agreement. That agreement is 99.99% done. It has not been executed. Uh, we would not sell these certificates of obligation until the agreement is finalized. It has to be done because we need to have that revenue source. Um, the way that particular agreement is structured is that the, the revenue starts, uh, the payments are made annually from TxDOT starting 13 months after the completion of the project. So if it's a two-year project and you've got basically three years, you, the revenue will start to come in. It's paid over, um, there's a minimum amount that we paid every year, that's 1.385 million, that's what's reflected here. The maximum amount is twice that, so basically 2.77 million. But the total amount doesn't change, it's $27.7 million. If you look at that $27.7 million though, that is nearly half of the debt service on the entire COs. So that's what I'm saying, when you look at that revenue source and you look at the vehicle registration fee, those revenue sources are very well known and pay for a significant portion, if not all, of the, of the debt service. So th that 27.7 is guaranteed we're going to get it. Exactly. I mean, we have there would be an agreement with, with TxDOT. Um, the, only, the only risk is completion risk. Basically, let's say we, instead of being a two-year project, it was a four-year project, you would not get those revenues until later. But we put these other reserves in place to try to mitigate that risk. So 13 months after completion. 13 months after completion, and then they make an annual payment. Now also, if you recall, you know, some of these revenues, depending upon how robust they are, they would flow through out of the flow of funds and Cameron County RMA could use those revenues for other things. In the case of the pass-through toll revenue itself though, there would be a fund and all of that revenue would be accumulated in that fund. So for example, let's say if the road was very successful and those revenues came in at twice the rate listed here, again, we're, the only amount we're going to get is 27.7 million, but they may come in faster. All of those funds would go into an account and that account would hold those funds and it would be used to retire debt early. We would not let any of that revenue flow out of the flow of funds and be used for other projects. And we would make that part of the interlocal. That would be part of the interlocal, exactly. And if it's that successful, could part of the interlocal include that the RMA take over that CO at some point in time? Or well, that's, that was gonna be part of a discussion, but just a little bit later, but yes, exactly. The, the, the goal here is the county is lending its credit to a Greenfield project to get it going. It's a project that everybody wants, the county, the RMA, the community. So you're, you're enabling the RMA to do that project. But ideally, the RMA would refund this debt with, with ideally it would be only toll revenue bonds. If we, if we knew there was enough toll revenue to support the debt in let's say five to 10 years, the RMA would refund this debt and the county would completely have it off, off its books. <clears throat> so if we look at the COs themselves, then you can see in the, in the next couple of columns, um, a couple of things. First of all, the, the rate here is listed as 4.17%. Uh, <coughs> that rate is actually has some cushion built into it. We, we think it would be more like 3.75 in today's market. If you compare that with the 5.19 that TxDOT was quoting for the, uh, the SIB loan, you can see that the rate is substantially better. In fact, this is a, if, if you have a project that's viable and you have a good credit like the county does, this is a great time to, to borrow money for those projects because interest rates are so low and it, it's very attractive. One of the things you'll notice, and you, you can see the principal um, payments, the interest payments, and you can see there's capitalized interest. So that's another safeguard here, is that there would be a capitalized interest fund that would indeed be controlled by the county because that's part of, really kind of part of your debt service fund. Those, those funds in that account would be used to pay the debt service on the COs for the first, what I have here is two and a half years. We could adjust that depending upon how things go before we sold the obligations. So for the first two and a half years, there would be no debt service payments at all on the, on the, um, the COs. This would allow the RMA to get through construction. It would also allow the RMA to use some of these other revenues that are already flowing and basically start to accumulate those monies in the rate stabilization fund and in the repair and replacement fund. 
those funds, again, Commissioner Garza, depending upon how you work out the interlocal agreement, can be, uh, you know, controlled by one or the other, or controlled by one with, you know, with the requirement to come to the county, for example, to ask for permission to use the funds. But they're meant, in terms of the rate stabilization fund, to kind of smooth out the monthly, you know, um, increases and decreases. And in terms of the repair and replacement fund, meant, for example, let's say we have. Um, you know, a, a guardrail that breaks down or, or toll collection equipment that, that is hit by a truck or something, you need to have some funds set aside to be able to make those repairs. So when would our first obligation actually occur, 2015? Uh, your first payment uh, would, there actually is an obligation right from, um, um, you know, this coming year, but you would have capitalized interest in the fund to pay that. So the first obligation were you could potentially have to do something would be in, in 2014. Um, it would be uh, 2000, actually it would be in 20, um, let me see if I can read my writing here. Yes, 20, 2015, correct. Um, 215, 215, I think I believe was the first payment. Yeah. Uh, what's also important to note, and, and it's not in this spreadsheet, if you go to the very far right column, the column before last, it says residual revenue. And what that basically is showing you is the projected surplus of revenues after meeting all the obligations, including paying the credit fee to the county. If what everything that, goes as planned. Exactly. What that means, Commissioner, is that if, if you accumulate that residual revenue, that residual revenue, let's say a year 10, which is the line, the first line that you see in 2021, if you add all that residual revenue, you will at 16 or 17 million dollars of accumulated surpluses. You can use that money to pay off the COs. So when they go about, you, you want them to get started, you want them to generate revenue, you also want them to help you take out your position. So when they go about issuing a revenue bond like, uh, like Dave says, not only do you have history created by the toll road, you also have created uh, surpluses that can be used to reduce the amount of borrowing they have to do, and then they're on their own. So that's that's. Uh, Does that's the, the residual question. revenue is that an account that is separate from? It, it's sort of like the last bucket. It can be used for any legal purpose. It can so be used to split more revenues. It can be used to. So we it. can we can we can, as part of our agreement. Yeah. Uh, in the interlocal include not only, of course, the, uh, the first part of it, you know, the, the rate stabilization fund, but also the residual revenue fund? Yes, I mean, that, that's fun. I mean, I don't mean to tie anybody's hands, I just mean to protect us. Well, well what, what, you want in that, what you want that fund for is to, to continue to do projects that they have to do. Right. I mean, they gotta do engineering on the other projects. I mean, this is the first project of five, right? Well, also, Noe, though, yeah. but if, if that residual money's there, and at that time, let's say 10 years from now, yeah. uh, debt, the interest rates have gone up, yeah. then it wouldn't make sense to get them get a loan or do other stuff at a higher rate when they can maintain this payment, especially if they can show that they have the income stream, but they would be freed up to use that money. Bingo. And that's why you want them, I think from a fundamental standpoint, you want to keep an eye on the rate structure, you want to keep an eye on when they borrow money. So if they come to you, you may be here in 10 years, you may not. I'm not suggesting anything, Commissioner, I'm just saying. Probably uh, But in 10 years from now, they come to you and tell you, I'll this is what we're doing. And this is what we want to do. We want to go borrow this money. Well, I think that gives you that, that leverage, that more people are involved in, in helping them, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. So at all times, they would have to come to this court. I think that's a fair request to ask from them. You all have to decide whether you want to. Our recommendation is very consistent in the way we advise many clients around the, across the state that, that I think if you're stepping in today to get them started, make sure they stay close to you. And I think it'll be a win-win. But I, I really believe that, that you know. it's worth your time. If, if you have expressed the, the level of interest you've already expressed to us that you want to get this project done, this is a very fair way and approach to getting it done. Um, it's got its risks as a, as a new project, but I think as, as Dave has, has shared with you, you know, we are attempting to mitigate those risks and, and, and controlling them. And that you're not gonna see a payment come and due from the county, if the county needed to, until 2015. Meaning that in 2014, you have to be making some decisions as to how you're gonna deal with the 2015. 
But if you look at it, in, in 10 years from now, if all those revenues are appropriate, you will have about $10 million in revenues from the four sources of revenues. You're gonna have property taxes collected along the corridor. <coughs> You're gonna have this pass-through toll agreement with TxDOT. You're gonna have the vehicle registration fee, and then you're gonna have the tolls. All those four combined are gonna generate about $10 million, $9 million six, to be exact. And your mortgage payment on those two loans, the loan of today, the loan versus uh, that you've already taken out on the license plate fee, will be about $4 million eight. So $9 million six is gonna cover $4 million eight. That's about two times. So there's $4 million eight of surpluses. Of course, at that time, we would not have to pay repairs and replacement fund. Mm -hmm. We would not have to have the R&R &R fund. <coughs> uh, I mean, the, 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 the rate the stabilization fund. The only thing you got is a $500,000 credit fee. Now, that fee, although Dave has it in there through 2037, it can go on. It can go on for longer than that. It's, it's more of a call, an agreement that you can make with the RMA too. Um, I don't see why it can't go forever, but in any of it, especially if you're doing well. But I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's uh, in Laredo, for example, I'm the financial advisor there, and Laredo is a bridge system that generates about $45 million in revenues, and the city gets 50% of those revenues. Those agreements were done literally 25 years ago, and we were right in the middle of all that. You don't wanna do that today. What you want is you wanna have help this, this authority get started, start walking. And, and I think when it starts walking, they're gonna recognize, if in fact you stepped in today for them, I hope, <clears throat> that, uh, that in the future, there should be, it should be a win-win for everyone. And I think, uh, I just feel like today, they don't have anything, and they're on the brink of doing something really spectacular, and you just gotta push them off to get started. Sure. And that's the way to do it. Let, let me ask you, Noe, would, would there be the possibility if, if we were to do this, maybe to make part of the agreement that the RMA would allow county vehicles to use these toll roads at no cost? Um, it could be, but I, I'll tell you, I don't know how, you, I don't think you wanna do that. You don't wanna establish a precedent that somebody gets free service, including, this, including the county. In fact, to give you an example, we represent the city of Brownsville, we represent PUV. The bondholder, the rating agency will see that as a beginning of a president establishing something that somebody's gonna get something for free. It's a toll, everyone should pay for it. And I, I just feel like the way the credit standards are today, they may look at that negative because that's one, one thing, what's gonna be next? What if the navigation district wants the same thing? What if other things? Well, but I think there's a difference here because if, if we're taking on the obligation we take on title, why should we pay to use our own property? Well, uh, I'm just telling you that as it is, you're gonna get this credit fee. There are other roads. I mean, you talked about, I mean, you don't have to get on the toll road. You can always get on the access road. But right. I think- Well, and I'm, I'm, what I'm talking about is efficiency. Let's say public works department needs to get from 77 to 48, okay? To the county, that's a cost of, you know, stopping at, at every you know area along the way or getting on that toll and you know on the toll it's not going to cost them money it's not a lost toll because if we don't get to use it the county's not going to pay for someone to use it it's not a lost toll it's just wouldn't have been used but by the same token the rma um i don't think loses anything by three bucks well no because the county isn't going to pay for public works employee to drive down the toll road. Yeah. So they're not losing anything. It's not a lost profit per se. Now, any private individual, I can understand. But the county, there's no way our commissioner's court's gonna say, okay, uh, we're gonna authorize 10 people to get toll tags and we're gonna pay your tolls. We're not gonna do that. Well, I, I can tell you, Commissioner, uh, as a, the market practice is you pay. Now, you certainly can I think the that you know, yeah. we, you know we could go on all morning oh, yeah. about this, okay? And I, and I think that that this is a, a good um, or all afternoon, afternoon discussion, and those things can be worked out with with interlocal. I think that all whatever we go into needs to be arm's length, and and I don't even though it sounds good that we don't pay, I think everybody pays, and I think that way I think it's just a cleaner deal, 
not have to worry about who's using tolls and who isn't, who's using the tags and who isn't, but we can work that out. I guess my, my bottom line is, is what is going to be the return on the investment for us? If we're, if we're dishing out you know, X amount of dollars, what's our return going to be at the end of the day? You know, look, look at it this way. Uh, Very simple. Like, as simple <laughs> as it can get. And, uh, that's a great question, uh, Judge. You know, today, uh, a 20-year loan, we did a 20-year loan for Laredo two weeks ago at a 295, 2.95%. Uh, Dave is showing you a rate of 4.1? 4.17. And we're using a 50 basis points cushion on that. We think the rate will be about uh, 375, 373. I think it's gonna be even lower than that. So if I'm the RMA and I'm getting a SIB loan of 5.2%, 5.19, uh, and, and you step it in for them, uh, there's something to be said for that rate, uh, that rate differential. But I, I just, I think when we put a $500,000, this $500,000, which is the column at the, the fourth from, the, from right to left, <clears throat> that's, a number that we pulled out from our heads. And basically, you're not gonna get that number until five years from now, when the system is, 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 you know, is running, I guess. We, we did it in such a way, we acted in good faith for the benefit of them becoming successful. And I just feel, Judge, that if you say, I'll give you an example. When we did the, uh, the Los Indios, uh, Cameron County at the time negotiated, I think, simultaneously. We did a Harlingen's agreement and we did Brownsville's agreement. And at the time it was that, A, if there are any losses on the way we operate that bridge, we go 50-50. If there are any profits, we go 50-50. I think I don't have to tell you today the lessons that were learned out of that contract. I don't think it's fair to act in good faith of pushing this RMA to become, to become the ongoing concern we all need it to be in order for them to be successful. So I hate to tell you this is what's right. You know, our return on investment, uh, let's say uh, if I brought uh, a Macquarie, if I brought some big in, uh, joint venture capital group out there, they expect an 18% return on your, on, on your position. So what does that mean? If you put $40 million, they want something they never could have bought six or well, seven. Well, then let me make it simpler. How much interest are we going to receive on the money that we're fronting? But forget the for, forget the ROI. Just. How much, I mean, what, what's an interest rate? Again, the, the numbers that were put in here are, pro, are work proposals. They're certainly used. Can, I understand, but what, what, what do those if, numbers if encompass? A, if $100,000 was paid over less than half a year, that's about 50 basis points uh, in terms of the rate of return on $40 million. Uh, the 200 is also 50 basis points, and it goes up. If you get to the 500000 it's about 1.25%. Yeah, but how much of that is, is principal? Well, again, and you don't, right? I mean, you're, you're, no principal. You, the, well, the we're, county would not be paying we're not putting money out. We're just allowing our name to be used for credit. Exactly. So, so the RMA would would benefit by having lower rates, and as, I'm going to summarize this in, in a minute. There's some other advantages as well, and you would have a return on your investment. Um, it's not an exorbitant return. It certainly can be negotiated, but I think there's no invention. What you want to do is you don't want to make it so that it's it's too. Um, um, uh, too harsh, if you want to use that word, so that the RMA can't be successful in these first few years when they need the revenue. But on the other hand, you need to be compensated something. So right, and I, and I don't have an issue and with I anything think, that, 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 that you've said. I, I mean, think I, that, that that says it all is a shared success. Exactly, exactly. The, I mean, the, we, we need to be just partners in the, the shared success. The, I think the true ROI, return on investment, isn't a fixed number. It's what revenue, what enterprise, what economic development, all of this is going to create for the county, which is going to benefit all the citizens. Property values, what, what's it going to do right. to the efficiency of the system? Well, and that's, and, that's, and that's true, but that is totally speculative. It is we anticipate something, but we don't have a clue as to whether it's going to be a three, five. I mean, I, I don't disagree with all. I'm just saying that I want to be able to be comfortable in terms of doing this. And yeah, we all, we're all making a lot of assumptions. Yes, but it's all speculative, that is you know, and you can, whatever. There's no but question. The only thing certain you're doing is you're stepping in. Correct. And that, let's make that perfectly clear. We're stepping in and we're taking on the obligation that if they don't pay, we will. That's right. So then what is fair for that? And I think when the judge says, no, hey, what is a question? I mean, what, what is an equal fair rate of return? It's really hard to say what is fair. What is fair, though, is that you push them off, not the cliff. You don't push them off the cliff. You push them off to be successful. And think about this, whatever they do in the future, they're gonna come to you 
So if they're successful, I would assume that if they're successful and you want to share in that success, you're going to have the ability to renegotiate that sure. in the future as they're successful. But at the end of the day, you're just getting started in this one little project of five projects. Well, and, and when you talk fairness, that's why I was saying, you know, can we do a deal where our county vehicles don't pay? I think that's fair. And that's well, something to be looked at. You know what? Let's, <laughs> you know, I, I as one think you just pay as you go and everybody treated the same and not worry. That's no more bookkeeping uh, nightmare uh, than judge, anything else. I will else. tell you, I, and, and, and the judge a lot of times don't come into the same terms, but here I am 150% with him in that the financial markets, it's not even a question of us, Commissioner, telling you don't do it, you can't do it. Actually, the financial markets are very steady in that nobody gets anything free. Right. And it is well, but it's not free. We're lending our credit. They don't care. They, you know, this, they're lending you money, and money is more important than credit. And it's their money. And, and so it's sort of like well, you don't dictate to the lender what, what he wants. When he can get away with other credits across the country where they don't ask for anything like what you're suggesting. But we'll uh, talk about that later. Can, we'll, can in, you know, and I'm looking at it like these guys are looking at it from the worst case scenario, and I'm looking at it from the best case scenario in a different method. I'm looking at it from in the inner local. You know, I have no doubt that the organization is going to be successful. You know, that's just pie in the sky. You can call it whatever you want, you know. I believe that the organization will be successful in what they're doing. In the interlocal agreement, can we include to be part of any uh, future debt that they incur and be able to, you know, look at the residual reserve, uh, control a piece of that as a county? Doesn't you know, it I mean, come no, to the same uh, issue? We're, we're, no, no, not really, because the residual reserve is something that is going to exist. You know, and I'm looking at it from ways in which, you know, we're, we're, we keep stepping out as a county in helping. And this is not the first step out that we make with the RMA. You know, and I've been a very strong advocate of the RMA. And I've seen some of the projects and some of the proposed projects that are being looked at. And the county has taken a very active, aggressive role in ensuring the success of the RMA. I want to take an active role as a commissioner in ensuring the success of the county as a partner with the RMA. And it occurs in other groups such as yours, whether it's HECTRA or where it's whichever one in some other counties, you know, or some other metropolitan areas. And, you know, I don't want to leave everything, I don't want to give up everything as far as the county is concerned. I want to be able to uh, have the ability to help in each case. I mean, once they become successful, they can do away with us. And then we become the stepchild. Uh, to I don't know if you understand my no, point. No, no, I understand it. It's a perfectly fair statement. I think that that is not uncommon, like a HECTRA or NTPA uh, uh, in Dallas, where they come to Dallas County, they go to uh, Collin County, Tarrant County. Uh, it's not uncommon for them to come and present to you their budget. And their budget is going to reflect their proposed expenditures going forward and going to give you a statement of how well they've done in the past. Uh, I think, as, as you say, keep in mind this, Commissioner, and that's why I think you're in a win-win situation for them and for yourself, in that this is only the first project. They're going to they're gonna have to come to you. They, it's it's going to be very difficult for them, even after five years of history, to take on a Causeway project, to take on an East Loop project, take on all these other projects on their own. It's a partnership, and I think you don't want to start, in my opinion, a relationship with a lot of gray areas that still not very, uh, very uh, certain. I mean, like, like the judge says, it's a very speculative, it's an, a speculative project. Granted, you're an optimist, and that's good, but it's still a speculative project. The only thing that is certain is you're stepping in. The only thing right. certain is that you have a license plate fee that generates about a million dollars over your current mortgage obligation. They're going to charge those, and that may get you another million dollars. But you got to make a two million dollar, two million a payment on these CEOs. So you're going to rely on another certainty. I, I already told Dave Gordon, 
we're not going to sell the CLs until I have TechStot committed to giving us a million four that they said that they would commit three or four years ago. That's, that's fundamental for us. So if I have a million dollars from the license plate, we have a million uh, four from the uh, pass-through toll, then all I got to worry about is another $400,000 from the toll revenues to make my $2 million a payment. You follow me? So then I, that's why I feel that we're going to be successful. I follow you, but I want to make sure that we as a court have a little influence on what the next project will be. I think you're going to have a lot of influence. Okay. Uh, but my point to you, Commissioner, is that you will have a lot of influence because I don't think they're going to be able to do that next project on their own. I think, I think they will continue to be accountable to you. It's in their best interest. I think what he's worried about is the day will come when our kid is off to college and then gets a job and is Forget independently that. sustainable. I have a kid like that, but anyway. <laughs> right, uh, <laughs> and so I think that's kind of, but you know, I think we appoint most of the board members except one, and I don't know if we could dissolve the entire RMA as well as a commissioner's court. If they got out of hand, let me let me uh, let me just add, let me just make a short comment, and then I won't belabor the point. But I, I tend to agree with this. This conversation is very intellectually an experience for me, and Commissioner Benavides. Uh, from the time that we started this thing years and years ago, we have always been transparent with this court. We've always come to you and talked about this is a partnership. This is something that that if you want to put it on the table, it's on the table, and you know that. I can come before this group and. And, and negotiate anything with you. We've always been that way. I don't want to cut that relationship by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you made us, you created us by legislation, and we're working for this county. I'll go back and say the very first time that I was appointed by the governor six and a half years ago, as long as I'm chairman, I'm gonna be at your, at, right at your, force, your step all the way. I want to work on that. We've got to go back to where it's six and a half years ago, and I know I'm belaboring the point here, but we looked at this whole complex of building an infrastructure in Cameron County to create jobs and economic impact. We are doing that. We're going to continue to do that. And that's what I don't want to lose focus on with being the chairman of RMA. And we thank you for all the support that you've given us, and we look forward to continuing this relationships in the years to come. Thank you, David. Anything well, else? on this, because we're probably going to have to meet again, but uh, we're running short on time. Judge, would you permit me one question, please? Sure. Uh, Mr. Hinojosa, you've mentioned several times we're stepping in, and I, I think I understand the context in which you're asking that, but today the question before the court is whether we're going to post a notice to begin this process, we're in, and until the commissioner's court has been brought before it a motion that obligates the county to the certificates of obligation, we're not technically, let's say, all the way in. We're taking the first step, but we haven't jumped in until we, you know, pass that motion. Is that a fair statement? That is a very fair statement. What okay. you have before you is an, oh, go ahead. Yeah, you have before you um, a motion to post notice to, with, of your intent to issue the certificates of obligation. As you may know, and again, we have your bond council here, you have to post notice at least 30 days prior, and then you have to post notice on the same week, a week, uh, same day a week later. So that kind of starts the process. What we would intend to do then is, first of all, to, to, to start to ready the sale. We would also take actual construction bids during that period of time so we would know the, the, the actual amount, not the estimated amount. You, you don't want to sell debt that you don't need. Um, we would also... Um, to get the, the, the final agreement with the, uh, the passage toll agreement with TechStop uh, finalized, and then, of course, the interlocal agreement would be negotiated. So there'd be opportunities where we would come back before the court, and then, of course, the, the final day of the sale, which we're proposing to be uh, on April 11th, coming back to you on April 12th, that would be the day that you would uh, approve the sale. But posting the notice is, means that we're going to do it. No, it means that you are, you're announcing to You're the considering public. doing that it. That we're considering, considering doing it. So then we'd have to have another vote to establish that we are going to do it. That's right. Okay. All right. Before that vote, though, Judge, I mean, before that vote, we promise you we'll bring to you an interlocal agreement for your consideration and review. I don't think it's fair to go out to vote and before. sell bonds, yes. right. sell the obligation. Well, okay, so what, is, what is it that you need from us today just to authorize this, and then we move forward, right? And that's we're looking about maybe 45 to 60 days? That's correct. Sir. Okay, do I hear a motion? So moved. By Second. Commissioner Gatza, same by Commissioner Sanchez. Any, no, no more discussion. Aye. All in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any aye. opposed, Adam carries. Thank you very much.
And it was, uh, I, you know, for whatever it's worth, in the presentation today in regards to a lot of this, I learned new stuff. Residual? You know. <laughs> you know, you did. Yeah. I, I, See, we already have ROI. We're already getting ROI. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know I can ask. Okay. Commissioner, yes. we Item should B. learn new stuff every day. If not, we're in trouble. <laughs> Consideration authorization to hold a public hearing regarding the replatting of Sycamore subdivision. Do I hear a motion to open public hearing? So moved. By Commissioner Benavides. Do I have a second by Commissioner Hernandez? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Item carries. We're in a public hearing. Judge, is this a request from the developer of the subdivision uh, to change the land use for lot 15 from residential use to commercial? Uh, this is again a public hearing. I don't okay, know do I, this is a public hearing. Is it, does anybody wish to discuss or make public comment either for or against the plat? You're, you're, you want to do it, right? Yeah. Are you for it? Oh, maybe that's why they were requesting interpret or to interpret uh, in Spanish the the hearing. Oh, Usted, can you do that? Okay, uh, ustedes son los dueños de la propiedad. Okay, okay. está bien. Uh, is there okay. somebody that wants to speak out against the replatting? Are you recommending it? You are. Ustedes están de acuerdo yes. con well, el cambio. Yes, they're ¿verdad? they're the ones that are requesting okay. it. I'll make a motion to close public hearing. Yes. Okay, exactly. one, one more time. Nobody speak out against it. Motion by Commissioner Hernandez, second by Commissioner Gatza to close public hearing. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, item carries. Item E, consideration authorization to adopt an order regarding the revision of plat for Sycamore subdivision is required in cabinet one, page 1979A, um, precinct three of the map records of Cameron County. Here a motion. So, so moved. Moved by Commissioner Gatza, second by Commissioner Hernandez. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any aye. opposed, item carries. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hecho. Yeah, paso. Uh, item F was, uh, do I hear a motion to table so item F so by Commissioner moved. Hernandez? Second. Second by Commissioner Gatza. Uh, all in favor, signify by, by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, item carries. Item G, discussion and legislative options. That was going to take a long one. Let me take a couple of, and Commissioner Sanchez is not here. Let me take a couple of items out of order. Uh, go to item K, consideration possible approval of the mental transport agreement with uh, Valley Health System. Was that to be tabled? No. No, right? I can't hear you. K and L. K and L are basically the same except the different okay. hospitals. Okay, I already read K, item L, consideration possible approval of the mental transport agreement with Columbia Valley Healthcare. Um, K is with the, what used to be Valley Baptist, and this is a, con a renewal of what we've been doing now for I think almost two years. Have you looked at it? Yes. Everything good? Yes. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. By Sorry. Commissioner Benavides, saying by Commissioner Hernandez, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by, by saying aye. aye. Any opposed carries. Adam L. L is the same thing except for Valley Regional now wants to fund one officer. Looked at the contract, Done. everything's good to go. So moved. Do I hear a motion by Commissioner Hernandez? Do I have a second? Second. By Commissioner Benavides, any further Question. discussion? Question. It's all entirely the same as the other except for the amount, right? Correct. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. All in favor, signify by, by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Adam carries. Let me go back. Item G, discussion on legislative options to pursue countywide economic development opportunities in Cameron County and possible action. He Commissioner out, Precinct he, 4. He walked out again. He walked out again? He walked out. <clears throat> okay, let me pass on that one. He's out there hugging somebody. Um, item H, that, that will be discussed after executive session. Item I, consideration approval of the creation of local data board in accordance with VACCP, Article 6010. How are you doing? I'll try to be brief with this. Uh, we had brought this before in September. Uh, basically, as a little bit of background, the legislature through the Code of Criminal Procedure requires uh, criminal justice agencies to report certain uh, data in regards to disposition of criminal cases, arrests, how they're disposed to the Texas DPS and the Criminal Justice Department. Uh, they've required, uh, they set a goal that every, eight, that every county and every agency uh, meet a disposition rate of 90%. So basically report 90% of the data. Um, in Cameron County in 2007, 2005, 2007, our rate is about 35%. Uh, what the legislature through the Code of Criminal Procedures uh, author authorizes is the Commissioner's Court to create a local data advisory board to analyze the data to uh, basically 
uh, if we're below 90% to create a plan to get it above 90%. Does the, uh, let me ask you, on that, on that legislative order, um, and it calls for us to develop a board, does, uh, how is it set up? Just the commissioner's court appoints how many members? Well, it's basically up to the commissioner's court. Because we're under 90%, there's certain required members, so right. someone from the district attorney's well, office. Uh, it's actually in the statute, uh, the sheriff, uh, the district attorney's office, the district clerk, the district clerk's office. So it identifies who's on that board, so correct? It identifies one member from the board. From the board, okay. In addition to that, we've also reached out to other uh, law enforcement agencies, other uh, agencies with the county, because we want to get everyone who wants to participate. Uh, Do you want to come back and get, or have you already provided us with potential names? We've, we've provided have you contacted? Names. Okay. Uh, we've reached out to the agencies. It should be. Uh, with the agenda item on the next page. Any, have anybody have any questions? I just have questions. Um, where do you come up with 2007 30%? I mean, is there like a paper here that tells me that? 2000. You said, did you say 2007 35%? Yes, it's uh, in the, the DPS uh, produces a report. The last report they produced is in. Uh, January 2009. It goes back from the years from 2005 to 2007, and should be included in the agenda. Okay. Yeah, but where, where, like when you said 2007, 35 percent, where do I find that in this report? Okay. If uh, on the first page of the report, um, this one. Yes. Okay. Uh, the third. We're the second cam cam county down. Right. So if you look at years reported 2007 for adult, reported dispositions were at 36%. For that year, for juvenile dispositions, were at 35%. Do you have the backup? Okay, 30. Is that pretty standard in the industry? That is very low. Sir? That's very low. So why would we be so low? That's part of the reason why we want to create this board. No, no, no. But I mean, why? why what, uh, we're, we're just can, not reporting. We're not reporting data. We're not reporting dispositions, the required data to the, to the party. So then when, when I look at like 2006, that was 36%? That's right. 2000 and, well, there's two reports. There, there's, there's two reports for 2006. I'm not sure why. That's the case. Okay. I guess that's why you need a committee to look at this data. Right, and one of the reasons why well, and what is, I mean, if we, if we have low reporting, what does that do to us as far as, I mean, why should, why should Commissioner Scott even appoint a committee? What does it well, mean to One us? of the reasons is it's mandatory within the legislation. Uh, okay. Within the legislation, it says if we're not reporting by 90%, Commissioner Scott shall. Now, there's no, it, it doesn't say what happens if we don't. One, I mean, one of the reasons why this is important, it's just important for criminal justice. If we have a case, uh, let's say a third DWI, if we don't know that there's two prior DWIs, you know, we might charge that misdemeanor as opposed to a felony. Um, if they're, they're not reported, then other counties, other jurisdictions might not be aware of that. Second, why it's imperative that we're asking that we get this done now is because while there's nothing in legislation that says there's any penalties, we've been contacted by the criminal justice divisions uh, that some of the grants that not only the district attorney's office has, but the counties has, may be in jeopardy if we don't get this within 90% by August, starting by August of this year. By and August of when? This year. August. So for example, we have uh, our domestic violence unit is funded through grants. That might be in jeopardy if we don't get this up. And it's not just with VA's office, but we've been told that's through other kind of grants that the criminal justice department uh, so do we have do we have an idea of how much in grants we have? Like come, I know we approve grants. It seems like every other week for you guys some kind of a you know some kind of grant. I, I, I don't have that. We don't have any idea. And this is just an advisory board to help us figure out what we need to do to get everything electronic. Exactly. And one of the one of the the duties of this uh, of this board would be to create a report to investigate. How we to make recommendations on how we can get this above 90 percent, and create a and uh, create a basically a plan. And uh, DPS is actually coming down. One of the reasons why we wanted this for this commissioner's court, DPS is actually coming down in two weeks. So we'd like to have a representative body that could meet with them to discuss this issue at this okay. point. In addition to this, uh, we've also talked with 
uh, the criminal justice department through the governor's office. And they've indicated to us that they've been, they've, were, they, if we could create a board, they'd be willing to fund one or two positions in the county whose sole objective would be to work with the board to get. Um, Who would fund it? The criminal justice division. I mean, is there, is there any on, in the law, the way it's written, does any of it report back to us so that we know where you're at with it? I mean, this is the first I've seen this. They would, it, aren't they supposed to report to us? This is it's an advisory board to us? Yes, it's an advisory board to us to basically make Okay, advisory to board us. to the DA's office or to commissioner's court? Commissioner's to court. Commissioner's court. So we it could be a county advisory board. Yes. So we could ask that they report to us right. in 30 days, for example, or whatever. Right. Okay. Uh, right. I don't have a problem with that. One, one of the things, though, I, I did notice there's five five people that have to be part of this. Sure. Uh, I know you have a list of board members, but I don't see anyone there from the IT department. Is there any reason? There, there's not particularly a reason for that. We could. We could always add members. We've reached out to different agencies, and some have reported back, some haven't. I would also say the auditor um, should have a representation if she's not on there. And um, the justice court judges, because there's rep require reporting requirements from the JP courts as well mm -hmm. to the state. And I don't know if this board looks at that, but if you're going to have a board doing that, and with this new Tyler Technologies that we have, uh, it can probably all work together to make sure that happens. Uh, and I know that um, DPS has report, reporting requirements as well uh, with their um, commercial vehicle enforcement. They do, and then one of the and we could always, uh, you know, we could always amend that, reach out to the departments and add board members. But one of the reasons why we wanted to get it now, we, we just want to get this ball rolling. DPS is coming back, coming in town. I think. Uh, February 10th, so we'd like to have some kind of representative body be able to discuss these issues. Well, I appreciate you bringing it to us for approval, something that we need to do, but I have a question. Sure. Uh, the Assuming we get all this done and, and, you know, how is this advisory board going to jack up that number? What is it that it can do to make go from a 36 to a 91 percent uh, if they don't have any power, they don't have any power to do anything other than just advising? Uh, and then it's going to come to us, and you're at 40. What power do we have to go back to your office and say, "Hey, you're at 40. What the heck? You know what's going to happen?" So, to me, I mean, yeah, it it, it sounds really nice, but I just don't see the meat and the teeth in this thing. I think that's a valid point. I think the first step in this is figuring out what their actual problem is, figuring out why we're at 40 percent. Is it something that we could easily correct, or is it something that's going to we have to come to the commissioner's board and ask. You know, but I, 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 and I, I'm not trying to be, you know, devil's advocate. I'm trying to be devil's advocate here. We can't even get our, our poop together when it comes to deciding who's at fault for jail overcrowding. And everybody passes, you know, the buck as to, you know, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. Blame me. It, but at the end of the day, really, it's everybody's responsibility, okay? And so, no, so now we're creating another, another little bureaucracy to tell us that you know we're, we're this, but we don't have any power to do anything about it. And I guess that's, unless there is some power in the legislation, like maybe we can you know, fire the DA or, or, or fire the or whomever. I mean, we don't have any meat in this. And I guess I know that we need to do it, but I think it's just wasting a lot of people's time. I just don't know, you know if somebody from the sheriff's office, if, if they've got the expertise to be able to tell you that this is why this is happening, or somebody in the district clerk's office, this is why this is happening. I don't know. But all I can see is we can't even seem to be able to figure out why we have jail overcrowding, and now we're, you know, this group is expected to tell well, us, well, you know. But it's very evident that if you only have a 30 percent disposition rate, it's got no place else 70, to, to go but up. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, let me ask you, Mr. Soto, um, the reporting, is it reporting by the county, reporting by the DA's office? It's what reporting are we talking about it's here? It's actually in chapter 60 of the code, every law enforcement agency, it finds what a law enforcement agency is and every law enforcement agency is required to report this to DPS and to the uh, Texas Criminal Justice Department. And you're talking about dispositions. Disposi and there's certain data related to dispositions, but yes, dispositions. And those are the, well, I guess, from my recollection when I worked at the DA's office, there was a CR 43 that came in, okay? And that was a form that had 
the offender from the time he's arrested, the top section was filled out by the arresting agency. The second midsection was filled out by the prosecuting agency, and the last third is filled out by the courts that would give the disposition. That's, I, I believe that's what we're talking about. And is this what we're talking about here? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's, a, it's, it's the courts that need to be involved, because the courts have to, to do that third part, be it the county or district clerk or the county or district judges. Uh, and you don't have any of the judges on here, so you probably need to. And we'll be willing to amend it if it were to get included. We want to make sure whoever is statutorily, statutorily required to be in there is required to be in there. I think that's what we have to do. But we'd be certainly willing to. Well, you know, go, go, and that's a good point, Commissioner, but you know, go ahead and ask them who from their Right. Area is going to be on there, and anybody else that you can think of. At least uh, I would even suggest maybe a member of the court to well, be to be on there as well. You're not even including like statutory required folks on there. Who, who are now? Who are, well, like uh, four and five. The clerk of the district court. The clerk of the district courts of the county, or a designee. Unless somebody here is a designee to them. The compliance yeah. on this on this report is basically three parts. It's the law enforcement agency, the DA's office, and the county and district attorney. So if like two agencies report and the third doesn't, you're still not in compliance. So we pretty much have to make sure that the three agencies Well and, do and I do, I, we understand that's that. That's what he's saying. But it says that the committee should include those people, right? Is that what that says? I think they, the I district think they court uh, there, that's the the first person from the district clerk's office. Um, so, but so those are county the clerk. clerk of the district court and the clerk of the county court. So it'd be number one and two okay. on that list. The sheriff. The sheriff. Um, yeah, two of them. There's two from there, and attorney in district and attorney in county. So the DA's office. And we did, we reached out to San Benito, we reached out to is Har there Harlingen, for example, Harlingen Police Department isn't a required one, but we reached out to them, some of them got back to us. The police them. chief of the municipality with the greatest population in the county, that would be Chief Garcia, yeah, we, or I, formerly Chief Garcia. Just a note on this, we already started, we're getting access to the DCPS website, and we're going back and reporting our disposition, if there any are missing. Okay, yeah, what, what it, I think, I've seen it before, when you look at someone's criminal history, uh, sometimes you'll see they were arrested by an agency, but then it doesn't show what happened. So that means the prosecutor didn't fill in if they filed charges or not, and then it doesn't say what the court did. But, you know, here, there, I think there's still, you need to fix that, uh, Mr. Soto, because let's say you get a case that you reject, okay? Well, when you rejected, there's a court that holds the bond on the individual. Like let's say it came out of the Harlingen Municipal Court. There has to be a dismissal on that case. So there should still be something that was dismissed in the municipal court. And that's something that I don't think y'all do. Well, in, in that maybe one of the, the something that the board comes up with, what's not happening mm -hmm. what, and what we need to do, if it's something that we need to do, or something that one of the other agencies needs to do. Okay. I think that's the first step in figuring out how to increase these rates. And are you telling us that the people that are going to sit on this board, if we find that, okay, let's say Harlingen PD is failing to enter that information or you are um, in your office failing to enter this information, that, I mean, how are we going to find out? I mean, you all have thousands of cases. Um, who, I mean, how can we say, okay, Mr. Soto, you failed to do this, do it, okay. Is that what you, you want us to tell you all? Is this what you're saying? Or are we as a commissioner's court with our designation of an appointee gonna point out to Harlingen PD, hey, this was rejected, you need to dismiss it. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that, that we would have the authority to do that. What we're asking for is that we, we bring these agencies together to develop a plan to first identify why this rate is so low and to work with DPS and to these other you know, agencies to determine what we can do to get them higher. And I'm not sure, as to, to the point about teeth, I'm not sure we could you know, order Harlingen Police Department 
to do something, but at least we can identify it. And I think that's the first step. In well, I, you know what? I think the teeth you can get are by including the board of judges and putting them in their local rules. That, that, that might be it. Um, but I, I, you know, in looking at the rest of the statute, I think more than anything, DPS just wants each county to be proactive in putting a plan together so that the reporting requirements will be fulfilled. Because that's basically what it says. I mean, it says we have to come up with a plan, and that plan must describe the manner in which the county intends to improve the county's disposition completeness percentage, ensure that the county takes the steps necessary for the county's average disposition completeness percentage to be equal to or greater than 90% in the first report to the Department of Public Safety submits under 6021B2 on or after January 1, 2013. So it's basically figure out what you're not doing and figure out how to fix it. All right, well, I move to establish the board, data advisory board, and compliance with the request with uh, the understanding that you're going to add the additional board members that we've suggested. From IT, the auditors, and the justice services. I okay. second that. And the district court. Moved by Commissioner Sanchez, seconded by Commissioner Garza. Any further discussion? Uh, the only I question mean, I have is when, when did we get this report from DPS? This is, this is, as far as I understand, this is the last published report of this kind that DPS made. This is from 2009. 2009? Yes. So we just had not acted on this? No one's acted on it. We, we, it says we should have done this in January of 2009. Hey, we're only two years late. No okay. biggie. We'll, we'll, we'll move forward. <laughs> Never, right? What's well, a couple of years amongst friends? <laughs> All right, I had a motion, a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, Adam carries. Judge, if I may. Yes, you uh, may. While, while this uh, creation of this committee does not necessarily give commissioner's court any, any teeth, like, like has been mentioned, I urge the court to follow through and to address compliance with the statute very, very seriously. Uh, the act of not uh, reaching a 90% completion would have severe, severe impact on Cameron County and on any municipalities and entities that are located within the county. Uh, Cameron County last year, and I'm talking about 2010, uh, had in expenditures over $22.4 million worth in federal and state grants. And the county employs over 100 people in, uh, that are paid by uh, And that's what he was, I think, referring to, that, that it could jeopardize funding. our grant funding. That is correct. You know, so but, but again, I mean, I go back. I mean, that, yeah, we, we do all this, and we, you know, tick and tie and stuff, but um, I don't see any teeth into this. I mean, what, what the consequences are if we don't get that up to where it needs to be, months. okay? And, and the, I don't see how we can, we can make it happen. Yeah, we can start identifying, but that doesn't put money in the bank. Um, so then what is it that, that, that we can do as a commission to make sure that these numbers go up? And I don't know if they're, I don't know. Well, I, I think the prove fact this? that- Yeah, by, we'll prove this and we move forward. I understand by, that. By but. creating this board, we're telling these different departments, hey, you guys aren't doing something right. Figure it out and get it straight. Right, and if they do, great. If they do not, I still need to see what the consequence is. Well, the consequence could be that no, no, we the take well, the next budget we cycle, money. we take one employee from each, and we create a new department, and we call it compliance. And all that department does is work on compliance. Yeah, it sounds great. Maybe it'll so, work. Uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm just saying, you know, we, we, we're asked to do this thing two years later, and now let me ask you, by what, how much time frame do we have to bring these numbers up? January 1, 2013. Uh, August? S September of 2012, the, the entities would not be able to- Okay, so we got eight months. JAG funding, and effective 2013, uh, the county would not get, or the entities would not get county from funding from CJD or uh, federal programs. Okay, all right. Which is pretty serious, serious stuff. Yeah. Serious. I think that's why Mr. Soto brought it to our attention. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Thank sir. you. All right. Can we vote? Yeah, <laughs> item, yes. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, carries. Item J, consideration authorization to purchase one voting system. Roger. Well, finally. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Judge. Commissioners, thank you for 
for allowing me to, to come before you and ask you for consideration authorization to move forward in purchasing a, this is an election management and voter registration system along with service to, to, uh, to help us this, and, uh, uh, put this to, to work. Uh, this is a system, yes, we presently have a system in place that uh, we work with for voter registration and uh, which we use in early voting. Uh, the system that I'm proposing to replace it with uh, includes election day um, a system. Uh, it has a lot more features. It's got a, a lot more um, areas and, and features that allow me to make the reports on a more uh, efficient manner. A lot of the information that's in there and that we can use from this system is not in the present system that we presently use. And if you recall back in, I believe it was 2003 when we installed the system that we now have, I, I mean, it improved our response to requests and information and uh, voter results uh, tremendously uh, from what we had, a manual system that we had before. This improves that uh, a lot. And uh, what I'm asking uh, you all to do today is to allow me to, pr to continue with pursuing the purchase of this and the funds will not be coming from general fund. These are funds coming from state funds uh, that were already allocated to us. Uh, these were the Help America Vote Act funds and the uh, Chapter 19 funds that we, that we get in uh, June or July of each year uh, based on our voter registration. Um, and uh, we, we may have to use some funds from our contract fund, which is the 180 fund, not from the general fund. And that's a very small amount. Um, I have uh, with me uh, Mr. John Metcalf. He is the owner of, uh, of the Votech Corporation, uh, and uh, he's here to to ask, uh, uh, answer any questions or, or help me with the uh, explanation of what this whole system does to our our system. Hey, if you don't, obviously you're advocating for it, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Does this mean that we're going to get our election results earlier? No. Say yes, Roger. Say yes. You're just, <laughs> just not going to get them any later. Yeah. What, what this is that does, possible see, to get them later? What this yeah. does is we have we have on on real time, if I if I may use that term, during early voting, have everybody on real time. We've got our system that uh, has all data readily available as soon as it's happening. Uh, this extends it to to election day, uh, also, where we have it, it, as soon as you go in to vote, it's already in there in the system that somebody already went to vote. Uh, there's a lot of other features in it that allow us to produce information. It doesn't necessarily mean that I'm uh, that that the uh, election results will be uh, earlier than they presently are, and the reason for that is because that is a that other system is uh, is through ESNS. This is this is a, a different. This is a different different area. All right. Okay. I had a motion by Commissioner Gatsa. Do I have a second? Second. By Commissioner Benavides to um, authorize the purchase. Any further discussion? All those. In I, have a, I have a quick question. Roger, did you look at other products, or was this the only one you looked at? Uh, there's other products out there in the market, but. And you determined this to be the best. Yes, sir. Okay. We've got, uh, if I may, 70% uh, of the registered voters in the state. Uh, uh, or operating or, or do go, go through the election process through this system. So it's been, it's a proven system. It's a system that's being used by some of the bigger, larger counties before us. We're one of the top 12, uh, and you have a bunch of big counties that are using it, and they, they are recommending it big time. Okay. Okay. Excuse me, Judge. Hold on, but just before you vote here, Roger, I'm, I'm curious. I hadn't seen this before just a few minutes ago here. But the, the question I have is, uh, is there any purchasing issue here? Do you all consider this to be a sole source product or? This is, this is through a DIR contract. Okay. So, yes, and, all right. and, the, uh, and the actual, this is a proposal, but the actual contract, uh, we will be coming back uh, and we will run it through you. Uh, before we get that finalized. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we were in compliance there, and I'm, I'm told by a learning council to my right that we are, so yes. good, thank you. I feel so much better. All right, I had a motion to second. All in favor, seeing about aye. Saying aye. aye. Any opposed, Adam carries. There's a couple of items left on the regular agenda, but thank we're you, gonna Judge defer those, thank you all. 
until after we get out of ex uh, come back from executive session. There's no objection from the court. Do I hear a motion to go into executive session so moved. by Commissioner Hernandez? Second. Do I have a second by Commissioner Gatza? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Item carried to discuss the following items. Item A, regarding real property concerning the concession agreement pursuant to co Code Section 551.072. Item B, confer with Commissioner's Court Legal Counsel re regarding results of an investigation into missing funds uh, pursuant to Code Section 551.0711A and 2. Item C, confer with Commissioner's Court Legal Counsel on contract issues related to Odyssey Phase 3 pursuant to Code Section 551.0712. Item D, concur with Legal Counsel concerning Frank A. Tompkins pursuant to Code Section 551.0711A, B, and 2. Item E, confer with Commissioner's Court Legal Counsel concerning contract issues with Coffee Shop pursuant to Code Section 551.071.